Voilà. Um, hello everyone, uh, online and uh, on the room, in presence. That's uh, an hybrid form of uh, of uh, meeting today. Uh, we are going to 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 discuss about uh, the the work achieved in eShape uh, about uh, renewable energy, but also to open uh, the discussion larger uh, in order to have also the feedback from other activity that are not in e-shape but uh, that are concerning really the renewable energy domain and uh, and really to to open uh, our uh, potential view of what can be done in, in this domain and that's a great pleasure for me to welcome you uh, for this meeting i hope that uh, you will uh, enjoy uh, the day and uh, uh, for those who are in uh, uh, hopefully we have some sunshine which is coming uh, soon and for the other one i hope that uh, everything is okay for you so um, we have a, a, a long day uh, in front of us but for first of all i should present rapidly who we are uh, so we are um, part of the psl university uh, that was created in 2010 it's a big university with a lot of uh, labs and uh, and teacher and researcher and student, of course. And within this uh, big uh, university, we are Min Paritech, an engineer school that, that started in uh, 1783, uh, a small one, but a uh, high level one. Uh, if you know the French uh, organization, we are on the top uh, three of, of, uh, of the uh, engineer school. So uh, less students. Uh, but a lot of research achieved in different domain, material energy, geoscience, mathematics and social science. And of course, uh, we have a, a strong focus because we are depending on, about, uh, about the Ministry of Industry in France. Uh, that means that we have to also, uh, in our duty, to take care about, uh, of course, the student, uh, the research, but also the competitiveness of, of uh, enterprise in France, in, the, in Europe. And uh, so we have this uh, big activity in terms of uh, contractual research uh, with uh, all industry uh, around Europe and even uh, larger than Europe. So in this uh, focus, when we go down, we are part of a, a center which is called Observation, Impact and Energy. Observation for Earth Observation, Impact for Environmental Impact of uh, Renewable Energy and Energy for Evaluation and uh, forecast of, uh, of uh, energy system. So we are a small te a team of 25 people uh, located in uh, Sofia Antipolis, close to, uh, to uh, Nice, Cannes, and Monaco. And uh, our focus is really uh, observation of resources, uh, um, environmental impact, and renewable energy. And we have a, a strong activity around the characterization of the renewable energy resource and their use. And also the, the focus on life cycle analysis for environment, environmental impact of uh, the different energy pathway. Uh, so in a nutshell, our main concern is, is really the characterization, analysis, and modeling of special and temporal aspect of renewable energy resource, but also of the environmental impact of the different energy sector. And so it's why we are so focusing on renewable energy, because uh, we, we are uh, concerned by uh, the energy transition and by the wish of uh, pushing uh, uh, this type of energy uh, in, the, in the energy mix uh, worldwide. And so our main activity are there, uh, evaluation of the renewable energy resource using Earth observation, but on the broad sense, not only satellite, but also in situ measurements and big models. Uh, development uh, around, uh, <clears throat> around the environmental impact assessment including durability and, uh, and also a strong focus on the dissemination of the scientific data, because it's nice to do uh, some nice tool, but that's really much more important to share it uh, with the community. And so uh, we, we are already focusing on this way of uh, discussing with our end user and trying to bring them uh, to the domain and taking the, the best advantage of, um, of sorry, 
of uh, the uh, the potential of Earth observation. So that's clearly what we are doing. Sorry, it's a, it's a mix of French and English, but uh, we have a, a look around the uh, Earth observation, environmental impact, and renewable energy. Uh, but also, we are taking care about uh, the way we are sharing uh, the activity with uh, our uh, our users. And that's uh, mainly the focus we have with the scientific informatics, uh, taking care about clouds, um, uh, about uh, HPC, sorry, and uh, other activity, and being able to develop some prototypes that are of very good quality and allow the people to, to test really the concept and go further. And then we also take care about the dissemination, which is key for us uh, with web service, quad, uh, catalog of uh, services uh, and access to databases. So, sorry. Um, we have, <clears throat> since uh, the inception of uh, the group on Earth observation, a big activity in, in this uh, area. Uh, we are part of it. Uh, and uh, looking to all the activity around energy and mineral resource uh, management uh, with a, a specific initiative called GeoVener, Vision for Energy, dedicated also to renewable energy. And uh, the idea of this is really to uh, promote the use of Earth observation for renewable energy. And so, uh, as you all know about uh, uh, Geo, uh, the idea is uh, to, to construct the global earth observation system of system and to make it available for all uh, for the, 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 the for the humans and uh, helping on decision making. Sorry. Uh, so let's talk now about uh, eShape. eShape is a, is a, a project that was launched in uh, 2019 and uh, eShape uh, is an acronym meaning uh, EuroGeo Showcase application powered by Europe and the idea is really to focus on this uh, activity of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, developing an uh, application. So the idea is really to take advantage of, uh, of, Euro of Geo and, uh, and for Europe and vice versa uh, from for Europe to Geo and to support the what is called the regional Geo, the Euro Geo. Uh, so it's a, a European uh, activity uh, at the level of, uh, of uh, Europe. Uh, and the idea is really to allow uh, Europe to be uh, a global France in Earth observation through Copernicus, of course, but also all the new programs that are launched uh, day after day and really to take uh, to make use of all the uh, European uh, capacity and improve the user uptake of all this data uh, for Europe and for the world, because uh, that's mainly where we, we are now. As you know, Copernicus is uh, mainly used also, is also used, sorry, uh, by uh, US and by, uh, by other country worldwide and disseminating all the, the benefit of uh, what's coming out uh, uh, from this program. So the, the vision we have developed uh, in this uh, project is really to develop operational services with and for the user. That's key in, wha in, in what we are doing. And really the idea is to create an environment that allows to, to exploit all the, uh, the assets, uh, addressing all the, the societal challenge and, uh, and pushing on entrepreneurship, uh, supporting uh, sustainable development of an, of an ecosystem. So it, it's more than just a project. Uh, the idea of eShape is really to support your geo and in that way supporting the, the, the group on Earth observation, geo. And we are focusing on all the, uh, the, um, the priority of geo. Uh, here are the three ones that are mainly known, uh, the sustainable development goal, but also the Paris Agreement and the Sandai framework. And, by chance or by construction, because we were knowing it was coming also, we are also supporting the one dedicated to human settlement. That was uh, the new one uh, uh, accepted at the last plenary of June. So some uh, fast fact for you. Uh, so it's a four year program. We start in 2019, going to, uh, to 2023. Uh, we are now 68 partner with seven showcase and 37 pilots. 
so we are talking in uh, the different showcase about health, renewable energy, ecosystem, water, disaster, and climate. And we are really pushing the development of, uh, of the pilot from TRL 6.7 to TRL 9. So this means to operationalization. And uh, so we start with 27 pilots and uh, 55 uh, partners, and we built on, our, on, the, on the project the idea of onboarding a new pilot. And that's what we did in two sessions, uh, two years ago and last year. And now we have 37 pilots in these different uh, showcase. So here are our, our key objective. Uh, so I, I can go through rapidly. So that's really develop operational services with and for the users to demonstrate the benefit of Earth observation pilots uh, for uh, the use of uh, all activities, to promote the uptake at national and uh, international scale. So that means looking to the market and also uh, pushing some activity for the public uh, decision makers, but also for the private uh, industry and for the citizen. Uh, to, uh, and that's uh, in key user community. And we are looking also for all the pilots to the sustainability uh, on the long run in order to make them uh, go through the Death Valley and being able to continue on the long run their, their activity and support their upscaling. And really, we try also to develop and to distribute the, the knowledge uh, and to disseminate the knowledge we have acquired during this project, uh, trying to, uh, to, to make uh, the awareness about what we have done uh, rising and rising. And so that's quite uh, uh, also one of the objective of such a, a workshop webinar that allowed to, to really push uh, the information to the users. So we are supporting Copernicus, Eurojo, and Geo. And uh, so we have developed uh, some important uh, approach in terms of co-design and co-creation with end user uh, to uh, also use all the distributed assets so you, you have to go back in your mind uh, four or five years ago when we start. Uh, the ideas were there, but not very used. Next year was a platform that get out. Get out. Uh, the uh, Earth Observation uh, uh, Scientific Cloud was uh, just uh, uh, starting. And so we push on the activity, uh, our, our pilots to, to, to really make them improve their, their knowledge and pushing on interoperability and compliance with the Inspire Directive. We promote also a lot of, uh, of uh, all the pilots in the different markets through EO Mall. And uh, we have built uh, with our colleague uh, a sustainability booster for market penetration support. The idea is really to have a mechanism that allows to go further. And we onboard these new pilots and offer them to support our strategic activity. All the, uh, the activity developed in eShape uh, have uh, something lead, uh, that lead to uh, try to extract a strategic finding and then to share it with the community. So this means that all the methodology, all the findings will be shared uh, during uh, the project and at the end of the project to the community freely, and then it will be able, uh, every body will be able to use it. So just to focus on two or three points, on two points, the first one is uh, the co-design. Uh, so when we start the project, uh, we hear a lot about co-design. And if you look to any of, uh, of the call or activity today, we are talking about co-design, but there was no real methodology that was applicable to us observation. So we decided to build a new one and that's what we did. And uh, so we will, you, you are able to find some, uh, some of the uh, elements in our website. And so the idea is really to engage the user and to build with them solution. And so we have developed a uh, kind of uh, di diagnosis that allows to, to have a, a view of uh, the, the four type of uh, co-design action that we should put uh, on action uh, when we have uh, identified the different situation. And that's what we did uh, in, uh, in, in eShape and which is uh, one of the big success that we had. And so it, it's, it's going on and uh, the, the co-design activity are shared uh, through webinars and through uh, other uh, type of activity. And today we are looking to the way of continuing the activity on, on the long run. The idea is really to build uh, uh, resilient fit activity that allow also to, to build on, on that. Then we have also defined this uh, 
this uh, conveyor belt, which is of interest. So the redder, uh, the more effort you need, the, uh, the bluer, uh, the less effort. And so for building any uh, activity, you need uh, uh, some action in terms of knowledge, in terms of capital, technology, and market. And then you have here, here a kind of representation of the, uh, of the, the, the need for activity that, uh, that are here. And so this uh, nice conveyor belt, which is for me a very interesting uh, thing, starting from idea and going to the commercialization and the expansion, uh, we try to put some effort to uh, support the different place. And here you have all the, the, the activity that we developed, uh, given some support to uh, all of these steps in the different uh, type of activity to support user market, technology, capital, and, uh, and, uh, and knowledge. And so, uh, I can speak also uh, a lot on, on these different actions, but I think uh, the best is to demonstrate that to the different pilot that we are going to present now. And so uh, I would like to, uh, to thank you again for participating and also to, uh, to wish you a, a good journey. I will come back, uh, of course, uh, during the journey. And hopefully, uh, we will have a, a good time for discussion at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, um, so thank you very much, Thierry, for mm -hmm. having done this uh, introduction and in shape as a coordinator of the of the, the of the project. Um, today we will have some uh, some uh, sessions, three sessions. First, I will present the showcase three because, as presented by Thierry, there are seven showcases. One of them is the showcase three about renewable energy. So I will do presentations, and then we will have some. A presentation of application based on Earth Observation mm -hmm. Copernicus uh, dedicated to renewable energy. So first, the pilot from uh, eShape. So we will have some presentations. And then second part of the session, one, uh, still some pilots from eShape, but also some, um, we have invited some other application uh, outside the, the project of eShape, the, uh, the, the framework of eShape, uh, presenting other ways and other applications to use Earth observation for renewable energy. Then we will have a session two uh, after the lunch for people who are here. Um, we still not are not able to send lunch by uh, Zoom. Um, we have a, a session two about the, the, the updates of information from Copernicus, uh, EU SPAY, um, um, Eurogeo, uh, Climate Service, uh, updates about information that can be used for, for with a focus on renewable energy. Then we will have a third session at the end of the day mm -hmm. organized by Thierry uh, with an open discussion to, uh, to tackle a new way uh, and a new way for um, having a new applications using Earth observation for renewable energy. So this is the over overview of the, of, mm -hmm. of the day. Uh, I will present now um, an overview of uh, uh, the, the showcase free. So uh, first, uh, first of all, a few words about the context because it's uh, it's very important. Uh, um, uh, owing to the, the the new report of uh, IPCC, the energy production sector. Um, um, corresponds to, let's say, 34% of the total net emission of green, uh, um, greenhouse gas. And it corresponds to approximately 20 gigaton CO2 equivalent per year. But this 34% uh, is only for the energy production sector. But if you look at uh, these figures, it shows that the energy, in fact, uh, from different usage, transports, uh, industry, and buildings correspond to 73% of the emission, uh, uh, GHG uh, emission uh, corresponding to the sector. So energy is a focal point for uh, the climate uh, uh, change. So the reason why it's interesting, interesting to have a focus on it. And if you are looking to the, um, the, the last uh, IPCC report um, um, issued in April to, uh, 22 uh, for the working group three, we can see that 
uh, among all the, uh, the, 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 the ways to mitigate the, and to reduce the amount of green, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission, you have different uh, types here. And the graph represents the amount of gigaton um, of uh, uh, CO2 equivalent that you can avoid thanks to these this different uh, um, uh, means. And energy uh, is there. And you can see that wind energy and solar energy is among the best solutions with some uncertainty because of the capacity to, to implement in real, in real these um, uh, this possibilities. And you can see that you have, of course, other uh, ways that are of interest, the carbon uh, sequestration in agriculture, et cetera. But you can see that renewable energy, energy has a large part to, to have in the climate uh, change mitigation. Of course, if you look at the overall uh, sustainable development goals from the UN, you have this, uh, the SDG 7 um, with the two uh, about affordable and clean energy. And you, you have two targets, ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services, and increase the share of renewable energy in global energy mix. So of course, you have the different, you have the different uh, SDGs uh, from UN and you have the seven one, but there are of course some interaction between the, the, the different uh, uh, goals of, uh, of sustainability uh, and the, the seven is, uh, is the focus today. Considering now the, um, unfortunately the war in Ukraine, you may have heard already the Repower EU, um, the new European Commission's plan to end the dependency of uh, on Russian, uh, Russian fossil fuel imports. So there are three, uh, three uh, lever, um, uh, means. You have the saving energy, so sobriety. You have the diversification of energy sources. And you have the acceleration of clean energy transition. So if we understand clean energy as a renewable energy, we can see that uh, uh, corresponding to, if, you, if we compare to the targets of the Green Deal in 2030, we are moving fast and uh, we sh uh, the, the EU, Repower EU, Repower EU plan is, uh, aims at going faster and further with clean energy projects, going for 40% uh, to 45% share of renewable energy in the energy mix. So the showcase renewable energy aims at providing innovative, mature products and services for renewable energy development and management, uh, leveraging European um, Earth observation resources, Copernicus, and to enable, to enable collaboration between research centers and private sectors, and engage data providers and end users uh, in the in the in the uh, supporting the renewable energy development using Earth observation resources. So it's a contribution also to the geo initiative, geo Vener, geo vision for energy. You have uh, here uh, a link uh, to, the, to the documents. And maybe we will have some discussion about this at the end of the day. And uh, of course, it's a contribution to the Repower EU and the uh, SDG uh, 7 from the UN. So as a, as a world uh, overview on the, the pilots uh, related to renewable energy within shape, we have uh, four pilots that will be presented today. And it's uh, the reason why this 3.1, 3.2 is that internally the renewable energy is a showcase three. So we have first the pilot 3.1, next sense, that will be presented by Stelios uh, Kazetis from the uh, uh, PMOD uh, WRDC, World Radiation uh, Center, uh, about renewable energy no casting and short term forecasting system. Then you have a second pilot, pilot about high photovoltaic penetration at urban scale. And we will have today two presentations about this pilot, one coming from the DLR, German Aerospace, 
and one coming from uh, uh, Armin, us, um, about the, 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 the PV uh, variability uh, simulations. Then we have about wind energy. Uh, so the two um, major uh, means to uh, mitigate the climate change uh, as uh, uh, said by the uh, IPCC report. So the merging offshore wind products and uh, an onboarded uh, project. So I don't know if you presented this concept. Uh, yes, the onboarded. Un un so uh, you have uh, from DHI, Grass. So, sorry, the merging offshore wind products is, is led by uh, the DTU and the WindSight first class input data for wind energy models is led by a uh, DHI uh, Grass group. So, all these four pilots will be presented uh, uh, coming soon in the first session. This uh, workshop has been inspired by a previous workshop. Uh, the first one was. Uh, who were organized by the DGGO um, from the European Commission. So the Copernicus for Energy, it was in October 2017, and maybe it was the basis of ideas for eShape. And uh, so it was about, uh, I, I look at, you have the link here and you have all the presentation that is available. It's uh, very nice to have. And uh, I have uh, listed the application that you can have at this time, um, uh, using Earth observation and Copernicus. So you have uh, wind and solar energies, but also water levels and flow monitoring uh, with satellite and uh, in situ measurements. Uh, you have marine renewable energy, uh, Copernicus um, uh, energy marine. No, it's a can. Uh, I don't remember the CM. C'est Copernicus marine energy monitoring. Monitoring services. Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Services. Sorry. And also, it's not about only the uh, renewable um, energy sources, it's also about the power infrastructure monitoring. And of course, we, uh, they had a presentation ab about biomass and about smart cities and re relation between energy and smart cities. And by the way, the, the pilot 3.2. Uh, led by uh, DLR, the part led by DLR is about also smart cities in a way. And uh, more recently, uh, we had a very nice um, uh, workshop um, proposed by Wikeo, which is one of the gas uh, in the framework of Copernicus. Uh, it's a Copernicus application for renewable energy in uh, Wikeo. It was done in April 22. And uh, you have here, you can see the uh, sorry, it's, uh, I don't know. Okay, it's not uh, downloading, but you can see the all the the video in YouTube, and you have the link there. And so, and more more or less, it's the the same list as uh, as we have presented here as applic or possible application. But I'm sure that we can imagine other application that can use Earth observation, Copernicus in situ measurements and model to have new application maybe in other domain as the one as, that has been listed there. So there is a high potentiality of renewable energy development, application development using these uh, different sources of information from Copernicus and Eurogeo. So thank you very much. Now um, we can, uh, I don't, uh, okay, it's nice, uh, nice in time. So we can start the first session uh, with a presentation from Stelios. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Is yours. You can have a drink if you want. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Stelius Saladis. I work in the Physics and Meteorolog Meteorological Observatory of Davos, the World Peace Center in Switzerland. And uh, I'm giving this presentation, but this is a collaborative work of people working in my institute, also in the National Observatory of Athens, and also MinParitech, Transvalor, and Sedare from Egypt. They are partners in this uh, uh, showcase. Uh, 
some small introduction, but uh, Kiri and Philippe already said a lot about this. Uh, why we try to do this? There are a lot of global and international initiatives for the mitigation of climate change and renewables, as you saw just before, play a very key role. Uh, it's solar energy is relatively cheaper and creates more jobs relative to other renewables. And also ESAP, uh, uh, basically, or in the core of ESAP, is dealing with uh, the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. Especially for this uh, pilot is number seven, the affordable and clean energy and the subsection to ensure the universal uh, access to affordable modern energy services and to increase the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. And uh, also ECAP is based on other directives for renewable energy goals like the Paris Climate Agreement and the GOVNR as uh, we, uh, presented before. So, the problem that this pilot uh, tried to deal with uh, is that uh, the increase of the renewable energy use has led to the need of fast, accurate, and high spatial and temporal resolution of energy forecasts. Uh, so, to meet these uh, commitments, uh, 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 there are some numbers here. For example, that uh, uh, this war energy outlook says that. Uh, uh, EU countries must immediately increase capacity to six times for current levels by 2030. This was in 2020. Also, global solar energy industry has worth of about 120 billion in 2019 and expect to employ about 18 million people by 2050. And also that considering that solar photovoltaic assets are valued by a lower estimate of the production, every 1% of uh, improved of uh, this uh, uh, ratio that uh, characterizes photovoltaic uh, uh, parks is worth about one billion per year. So ESAP and other European resources uh, provide this innovative, uh, provide the funding for the innovative and mature products in order to deal towards this direction. Uh, so this forecasting pilot of ESAP started as a uh, uh, I try to build uh, uh, a certain forecasting pilot, but also in the course of the project has been also dealing with past data, so exploitation of historical data to define long-term solar potential to specific areas. Also the now casting that came from a previous project, GeoCradle, in, that provides real-time current solar radiation and energy at pan-European and Middle East and North African scale. The short term forecasting that was built uh, during the course of this project. So, a forecast for the next zero to four hours. Then, uh, after some requests from users in uh, ESAPE, there was the long term forecasting uh, activity for a provision of a forecast of, for one up to four days. And uh, I have to say here that uh, all this. Uh, things that you will see here and the demonstration of these uh, different aspects uh, are built uh, based on a lot of assumption in order to try to show to upscale and so a pan-European level. But if you go down to a location level, things uh, can change and uh, put much more effort on the accuracy in this particular location and, uh, uh, and not to timing that uh, it's the main a problem for uh, for this uh, uh, upscaling. Uh, so I'm going to pass this uh, uh, pass this objective that has to do with uh, uh, also is safe, but uh, we try to to use the Copernicus uh, comes uh, products, basically the aerosol product, the forecasting product for from Copernicus, and uh, also as observation from uh, MSD Severi satellite and also other atmospheric parameters from other satellites. Uh, this first two that I mentioned in real time and the others uh, in near real time. So the expected user community are grid operators, power electricity corporation, ministries, and energy trading companies, researchers in energy and also citizens. Uh, so uh, you can see the partners of uh, this uh, pilot. And I'm going to start with the first uh, 
approach of the same system, which is the now casting synthesis system that was built uh, during in 2018. So this system includes uh, real-time information from clouds, from MSD satellite and aerosol from CAMS, and also all the other information from other satellite-based data. And the main innovation, let's say, about this product in order to go to a pan-European scale was the introduction of some neural networks that uh, could easily read from pre-run libraries of radiative transfer. Uh, so these products are spectral irradiance products, so someone can weight these products with uh, any action spectrum to go from energy or other health issues that I'm going to talk about. The spatial resolution is five by five kilometers and uh, the temporal resolution was in real time. You can see this video of this uh, uh, now casting solar energy products for three days, uh, for more than three days. You can see the global horizontal irradiance here and uh, with blue, the attenuation mainly from clouds. Uh, then, uh, uh, together with colleagues from the National Observatory of Athens, uh, we have uh, also evaluated these products based on surface, the, the baseline surface uh, solar radiation network data with uh, quite, uh, uh, I think, good results, especially going to daily and monthly values, monthly uh, integrations. And uh, after sense in this easy project, we have built this next gen system that, uh, in addition to the existing system, it was also a built up cloud motion vector module. So, using uh, cloud pictures from the satellite, we can build this cloud mo motion vector and predict what uh, the cloud situation will be for the next uh, few hours. Uh, so, uh, more or less, uh, the way it was built is a way that uh, uh, assigned some vector for its particular location or uh, region. And uh, we also uh, evaluate this uh, for different days with different cloud, uh, uh, let's say, patterns. Uh, and I have to say that this was a very difficult evaluation because uh, this European domain includes uh, about 1.5 million pixels and evaluating a single uh, time stamp it's kind of difficult if you go to a number of different times and number of different days. Uh, you can see a small now a video that how this works and it's uh, also online someone can try it. Uh, someone can just uh, it's real time so someone can go somewhere for example here, so this is, uh, I think, for two days ago, uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. So someone can go to any particular place and can see what is the solar radiance right now, what was uh, three hours before with a step of 15 minutes and what it will be in three hours ahead. Uh, probably Saturday morning was a clear sky day here, but uh, if you go to another place with more clouds, for example, here in Venice, someone can see that, uh, uh, for example, in the morning it was quite uh, sunny. And uh, then uh, uh, in this particular time, it's nine o'clock in the morning. After that, you can see the, that clouds are moving fast in this area and the solar radiation is going uh, down. Uh, now about the users, uh, about the past data, we had a continuation of the collaboration with the Ministry of Electricity and Renewable Energy in Egypt. So the first step uh, done in 2018 was the, to build up some kind of solar atlas for Egypt based on Copernicus uh, data. And then uh, the ministry has uh, asked information on specific, specific locations that would like to install some photovoltaics in uh, behalf of the government or some private companies. So there was a, a report on, this, on these sites and the climatology of solar radiation for these sites. Also, there was a request from uh, the Heart Foundation of Magdi Yacoub that uh, they will, are going to build a hospital in the area of Aswan and they would need, they would like to have these solar panels in order to uh, have energy for the hospital, but also to 
provide some energy for the area there. Uh, then there is uh, the Greek National Independent Power Transmission Operator, uh, uh, which uh, more or less does the, the, the operation of transmission of power for Greece. And uh, they have uh, used uh, at some point the now casting and the forecasting system, not for day to day on the day to day planning, but still they are an experimental kind of phase to use it. Uh, then there was interest from other companies from India, Sanel and Adani Power. And this was a challenge because all these that I saw before are based on the Severi satellite that covers mostly Europe and Africa. And for covering India, someone had to go to another satellite system and to implement this work to another satellite system that was done uh, uh, for a specific case uh, in India for and also publication was there. Then it's the Public Power Corporation Renewables. The Public Power Corporation of Greece, it's uh, the corporation that provides uh, something like 80% of the total power in Greece. And this is uh, another company created for renewables. So in Greece, there are uh, mostly coal related, uh, uh, there are coal related uh, uh, power, uh, uh, power systems. We can see the two biggest ones, one in the northern part of Greece and one in the southern part, the Ptolemaida and Megalopoli. So the plan of the government and also this public power corporation is to close down slowly these uh, factories or power generator uh, uh, areas and uh, have uh, photovoltaics there. So what uh, the people asked was some kind of uh, uh, assessment of uh, solar radiation, the clouds, and also aerosols for this particular areas in order to have a, a clue about what they expect for the future. So this kind of assessment included an assessment of solar radiation from 2004, also cloud attenuation for these two areas, and also aerosol attenuation based on these are monthly values starting in 2004 and ending 2020. Uh, in addition to actual users, there were some more uh, scientific, let's say, collaborations. One was the inclusion of this, uh, let's say, uh, forecasting system to a new European project, which is called Teaming, uh, Teaming Project. These Teaming Projects are uh, projects that are funded to some uh, specific countries, in this particular case, Cyprus, and uh, institutes from Europe, uh, transfer their knowledge in different kind of system. Uh, for this particular project, there is also uh, DLR involved, TROPOS from Leipzig, the National Observatory of Athens, and my seat from Switzerland. So in the case of the solar energy, what we did was an uh, assessment of uh, solar climatology, let's say in Cyprus, based on uh, 20 years of satellite data with a collaboration with uh, people there and also Tropos Leipzig and uh, a financial assessment of uh, the effect mostly aerosols and clouds for this particular area. And the interesting thing was to see that, for example, for uh, summertime aerosols play and also spring and summertime aerosols play much more important role than clouds in Cyprus. And aerosol typing, it's very difficult there because we have uh, pollution from Turkey, uh, dust from Sahara and dust from the Middle East, which has also different kind of properties. Uh, in addition, uh, we have uh, uh, tried to investigate the effect of some uh, in dust intrusion. This is uh, an intrusion of 2015 that was published in a, a paper. 2018. This was the second biggest intrusion in the last 20 years. The biggest one was kind of later, 2018. And uh, there we calculated uh, 50 and 80 percent attenuation of uh, solar radiation for PV and uh, concentrated solar power systems. Also, after that, we tried to build some kind of climatology for aerosols for Europe. So, using this satellite data and uh, cloud, uh, sorry, aerosol data from uh, different satellites from 2003 to 2017, 
try to build some kind of climatology looking you can see on the left the direct normally radiance attenuation this is a average attenuation for all these years and uh, from the on the right the global horizontal radiance attenuation from all these areas and if you go a little bit uh, deeper on that and you can see three different domains one in the uh, yeah yeah one in the uh, northern africa uh, let's say middle of it of uh, mediterranean and south southern europe let's say domain three you can see the changes in the direct normal irradiance due to dust which is the green lines due to other aerosols and the total one so there are a lot of things to discuss here but just to say that uh, of course dust has a more pronounced role in the south and also you can also see that during the years at least for the last 15 years this effect uh, has been a little bit uh, less uh, so there are also other products because of the spectral output someone can weight the spectral irradiance with other products so it's easy to calculate for example uv index for skin the problems the dna damage the vitamin d with the positive thing and also for the agriculture is the photosynthetically active radiation which is uh, the visible part of the spectrum uh, that's why it was built this this uv index system that uh, more or less follows the path of the solar the sense uh, energy system but uh, with more focus on the uv so uh, we have to deal much more with uh, factors like ozone and the uh, uh, spectral uh, features of the aerosols. So this product was used also in the Indian superfast ferries, some like some application for a couple of years. And finally, uh, some conclusions and remarks. Uh, I guess people that deal with uh, solar energy know that solar forecasting is uh, very important and a lot of applications are based on this uh, product uh, in order to have reliable and accurate short-term irradiant forecasts uh, we use this cloud motion methodologies while this uh, numerical weather prediction models can be used for longer forecasts and uh, one comment is that one method does not apply everywhere someone has to do a lot of different things concerning side adaptation so some hybrid approaches uh, building earth observation systems with models measurements if they exist the climatology or geographical or meteorological aspects of each area so for a specific user i think nobody can use uh, the same model everywhere uh, without any uh, alterations so in the end the choice of application for forecasts or other depends on user needs so you've got to be very flexible on application input strategy and uncertainty versus speed which is always a problem uh, the measurement data if they exist more than the satellite products and model availability and also spatial temporal aspects and other technical aspects of specific areas thank you very much we have time for a uh, uh, couple of questions yes yes i have one on your slide regarding the aerosol attenuation uh, i just want you maybe to explain oh yeah this one uh, why is there uh, a switch between the so-called other between dust in the dni uh, what do you mean switch yeah, on the left side, you have the green, which basically the other aerosol effect, which seems to be higher than the mm -hmm. two as a one. On, uh, on the yes, dust for... is lower in the DNI. So is there, maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, <laughs> I was just wondering. Yes, for the domain one, because you have much more dust, the effect of dust in the DNA it's uh, more. So more. it's about 20% change of the dni minus 20 percent change uh, yeah, 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 yeah because it, it, it's a reverse, reverse. Seems, yeah. just looking at the, the figures the, okay. the, the dust seems to be lower effect than the other effects 
but in fact, it's a uh, reverse. Yeah, it's higher. It's, it's, it's higher. Like okay, so, so yeah, okay. Okay, so that was, okay. DNI goes down by minus 20, by 20%. Yeah, that's that's a, why yeah. minus 20 is. Okay, so not yeah. disabled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. No, no. <laughs> so, yeah, the total is around 30. And yeah, we cannot add the green and the yellow line, but still, it's. Uh, uh, yeah. So, the, the percentage is a sum of uh, others and desks? Oh. Uh, uh, maybe uh, there is water, water vapor as well, as well. No. It's, no, it's just all, it's just, just the Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the way to calculate it, it's not just the subtraction, it's uh, only dust and only everything else fit in the radiated yeah, trust model. So it's uh, not. So not it's not the it's, uh, yeah. some, uh, Okay, it's because it's fixed that, so. Yeah. It should, it should be close, but it's not too linear again. Yeah. Uh, indeed, it's very important. And when we are thinking in, as a European centric, uh, views when we are thinking about solar variability we are thinking mainly about clouds and yes. maybe water vapor but in other parts of uh, the country then uh, in countries just like the domain one since there is no not so much cloud variability then and since that there are some dust events the, the solar variability is mainly driven by uh, by by the dust and the aerosols right mm -hmm. and so the forecasting needs to, to, ta to tackle these sources of liabilities as well. Yes, yes. This was for sure the case in Cyprus that we were kind of, let's say, surprised because in, uh, yeah, in summertime and not spring, the effect of uh, uh, aerosols was much more important than clouds. And there, the, the forecast of aerosol, it's, I think it's more difficult, especially the type. Yeah. And then not to forget biomass burning in the, the yeah. southern hemisphere. Yes. yes. Um, did you ever check uh, if there are the cloud events which are consequence of mm. the dust events? No, it's just uh, this is only the direct effect. Yes. So, yeah. Because uh, just uh, two months ago, we had a desert dust event in the Iberian Peninsula. And not only that, it already some impact, but then it created a big layer of thick clouds. Yeah, yeah. And overall, it cut 80% or yeah, 70%. Yeah. It was like a mess. The indirect effect is really very important, but it's very difficult. Yeah, to yeah. Prove. Exactly. yeah. Thank you. From the side of the, uh, the Zoom and uh, the attendees, do not hesitate to raise your hand if you have any questions or use the uh, question and QA. Um, uh, application at the bottom of your screen. Anyway, we will have some rooms of, for discussion, but I think that now we can uh, thank you very much, yeah, Stelios, for your nice presentation. I know it's the time for Suzanne and Jethro. We managed to, to switch the presentation. I have two guests. Okay. Um, and this one. Hello, everybody. We're Jeffrey Betka and uh, Susanna Vyant from uh, the network of the Institute for Networked Energy Systems of DLR in Oldenburg, Germany. Uh, and we are going to tell you something about uh, using Earth observation data to improve uh, renewable energy scenarios um, on an urban scale. So we all know this kind of graphs um, about the fast cost decline of renewables and especially of photovoltaics. But now it's accompanied by a similar graph for storage. And this is just with the iron. iron. Uh, and of course, there are other technologies that will pro probably uh, be more suitable for grid storage in the long run, like flow batteries. Um, but if you are a, lo a local grid operator or a local decision maker, and you want to know uh, how to best 
uh, optimize uh, your grid for these new developments uh, and how they can best you know you can best deal with the variability of uh, the demand and production of renewables um, then you have a bit of a problem because most of the studies uh, scenario studies on how to optimize the grid for this uh, for renewables and storage are on a national scale or even international scale and they mostly use proprietary uh, software, proprietary data, uh, or the software is just uh, a single use software just for this single study. And you can just uh, apply it for your specific uh, situation. And that is um, why uh, colleagues at, uh, at our institute developed FlexiGIS. Uh, which is an open source GIST based platform for the optimization of flexibility options in urban areas. Uh, so what can this do? It uh, can uh, use um, uh, open street map data uh, to derive uh, demand and the variability of this demand, uh, which is visualized here. Uh, and from this, it can also derive uh, from this kind of data, the uh, production, and then it can be used to optimize the whole system. Um, so how is this done? There's uh, three um, blocks. The first is to create uh, the, the spatial framework uh, from uh, to do this on a, a GIST platform. Then the second step is to create uh, data and time series for both production and demand. And then the final step is to optimize the combination to scale, uh, storage and renewable production to get the optimum result. And what optimum is you can choose to say you can choose for maximum autonomy or I want the cheapest solution. Um, So, and currently the input data is what I already mentioned, this open street map data is used um, to drive building type. Uh, and from building type, you can drive uh, uh, the demands like industrial buildings have a different pattern during the day than um, residential areas. And you can derive information on the available amount of roof space to put PV systems on. And the second data that's important is the meteorological data. And in the current state, this is ERA-5 uh, analysis data. And both uh, of these data have some limitations. With the OpenStreetNet data for the PV application, you miss the data on the roof geometry. So it could be all flat roofs, it could be all uh, saddle roofs, uh, it could be orientated in the same way, you don't know. Um, and you also don't have data on existing systems. So the alternative that we're now working on is to use airborne earth observation. So a plane flies over a city and makes a scan with uh, complicated instruments. And then uh, you can get very high resolution data with uh, an information on the roof geometry. So you know how the system's oriented and you can, um, from spectral analysis, you can catch uh, the PV systems and even the kind of the technology uh, for the PV systems. Of course, this had the disadvantage that you get away from the original idea to use open data because you have to order such a measurement campaign and it can be costly. So in the long run, we want to change to satellite data, uh, which is of course more difficult because you, uh, instead of flying a few hundred meters uh, over the target, you uh, have a satellite at several hundred kilometers. And um, so that is technically more challenging. But it's a big advantage, then again, you have free available data. Uh, and that's what the original idea was. Uh, for the multi data, the era 5 data has the disadvantage that it's 
uh, resolution uh, is limited. So that's why we're then changing to the data from the COMS uh, radiation service, which is a higher temporary, uh, temporal and spatial resolution, and which is also free to download just as uh, ERA-5 download uh, for ERA-5 data. And in the near future, we will change from the current generation of satellites to the new generation of satellites, which will further increase the um, resolution of the data. So you can better catch more of the variability of the PV production. Uh, now I'll change to my partner. <laughs> so I will explain you now what high resolution EO data we want to implement in this flex series. So as Jesro mentioned, we have one part we have here, the, the really um, buildings and, um, <coughs> and um, yeah, earth information infrastructure data and the PV load system um, will be also some input needed for such um, earth observation data. For those, as Yithro mentioned, uh, we made some flight, cam flight campaign with our DLR airborne uh, systems. This strange or <laughs> um, hard to understand sensors. <laughs> uh, at the moment, we are in the post-processing step. So we have raw data and they are need to be further processed to be implemented in the software. Um, here you can see such high resolution data set. This is an optical uh, set. It's uh, collecting some, some auto photos here on top of the left. From these auto photos, some DSM is generated, what is uh, done here by some colleagues uh, of, um, of uh, Oberfassenhofen. Uh, from those input data, we can make some classification and uh, extract buildings, trees, and land cover information. And an example for this, you can see here on the right side. So you have here uh, the river, what can be uh, classified buildings and trees. Um, what we extract else from uh, this optical data, this, as I mentioned, is the, the DSM, uh, what was generated for Oldenburg. So we can extract the roof type. So if it's flat roof, it's a gamble or mustard. Um, and we can also extract the height information as well as the slope and uh, the aspect what we need for the um, PV modeling later on. Um, additional for the detection of the PV panels and the classification of the PV panels, we are using a so-called conven convolutional neural network. Therefore, we uh, trained some um, uh, some CNN um, labeled training data and have some gone through campaign. What you can see here on the right, right side is um, the red ones is some PV systems. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, covered by, by the, the legion on the right side. Um, so the yellow ones is the ground truthing. The green ones is uh, some um, thin film layer modules. And some blue ones here in the top is some um, solar thermal modules. But unfortunately, the accuracy is at the moment just around 70%. So therefore, we um, are working on the optimization of the network. Um, we have also from Flake campaign some high resolution data sets um, of, of uh, hyperspectral data. So in the left corner, you can see such uh, collection image and um, the hyperspectral have the the chance that you can see a long um, long region over the wavelength so each pixel what you see in a uh, down corner right uh, would give you such a line and therefore our colleague um, in Oberfassenhofen she used some uh, index analysis so she chose some specific indexes what you can see in the red corners and, um, and um, yeah, make, make some plus, uh, extraction of the PV panels. Unfortunately, we just can uh, detect for the, uh, crystalline modules. Um, here on the right side should be shown. <laughs> um, there are some um, thin film layer modules and they are, cannot be detected. Um, so we have still some advantage to um, yeah, progress this to have some also the, the thin film layer and the 
um, other PV panels, but uh, at the moment it's not detected. Um, as Jethro also mentioned, we want to go to satellite images. Um, therefore, we need to know the impact on the energy system analysis. So as you can see here down, you have the high resolution airborne data. And in the top, there are some uh, images from Worldview 2. This is um, one of the most high resolution satellites you um, can use at the moment. And you can see we have some effects. So if we have some lower special resolution, we could not see anymore here the PV system, or we cannot see anymore the um, thermal system. What is also a big impact is the collection time. Um, so the data should be collected as close as possible that we have not uh, uh, growing up buildings or uh, similar issues. Um, coming back to Flexicus, we are working now to uh, generate a graphical user interface um, for the Kugels as a plugin. So in the left side, you see the, the Earth, um, the, the OpenStreetMap data. And on the right side, you can see some Earth observation data from current net cover. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we implement now here the shapefile data set. And Gierstro will explain how we choose now the collected Earth observation data and the CAMS radiation in our um, predictions. So, OK. Um, the second Earth observation data that we use is the CAMS radiation data, um, which is a service that we, uh, as the layer, provide together with Min Paris and uh, Transflora and the Finnish Meteorological Network. It uses data from uh, the MSD satellite, uh, at least for European uh, area, and it uses um, atmospheric data from uh, other CAMS surfaces. Um, so, so um, how does this impact uh, our modeling? This is the old setup where we just have one single PV system. So this. Uh, because with the old setup, we don't have the information of the roof. So we assume, okay, we just take one representative PV system and scale that to the size of the city, uh, which is, of course, not very realistic. So we want to go to the new approach where we have taken into account all the roofs, uh, but just this one flight over session for um, all the work that already delivered 400,000 roof elements. So that's a bit much to model, even with uh, a big, uh, even with a big, very big computer, that's still a bit too much. So the first step is to make an accumulation and then put it in the PV model uh, that goes into FlexiGIS. Um, so what is the impact of that? Um, at this moment, we're not completely ready, so I made a, a bit of a trial uh, calculation. So with the old setup, we assume a single system and a copper grid, and we use the era 5 data, and you get a black line. Um, and if we then change to 21 systems, which is the blue line, but still using era 5 data, you see that the peaks get smaller. That's of course you have uh, not all roofs are oriented south uh, anymore but they're also east and west so you, your peak in the middle of the day gets smaller if we then also change to the comps data you get much more detail because the temporal resolution is much higher so you catch much more of the variability which is very important when you have to deal with storage and so how does it impact our scenarios um, this is a very unrealistic scenario, but it's the standard example for FlexiGIS, so I just went along with it. Uh, that is the scenario where you want to go completely autonomous as a city, which is overly expensive and doesn't make sense, but it's just here for illustration. And you can, and in this scenario, you, you want to max out your PV. So you put PV on every roof. And of course, in the old way, uh, it means that your peaks get uh, higher. Uh, so here the PV production is smaller and you have to be overbuild completely. You see this here with the wind, you throw away the, the purple, here's the demand. 
and you throw a lot of, away a lot of wind energy, but you want to be completely autonomous. But the result of now using a more realistic distribution of PV systems and using more realistic irradiance data is that you need more storage. And I found it first a bit counterintuitive because you would expect um, uh, with a more distributed geometry, you have more uh, production in the morning and in the evening, that's, and then you would expect there's less need for storage. But because you chose here maximum autonomy, uh, you want you really need maximum production, and uh, for that case, you then need more storage if uh, your PV is not all south oriented. Um, so this just serves as an illustration what the impact is for having realistic data and why we want to use the Earth observation data. So in summary, with FlexiGIS, for the, uh, decision makers on the local grid level uh, have a tool uh, to optimize their system and to calculate different scenarios, also for different economic assumptions. Um, and it helps them to plan uh, their system. And with Earth observation data, we can increase the accuracy and the realism of such scenario analysis. Um, FlexiGIS is available for download. This is still, still the, the old version without uh, the Earth observation data. Uh, but please be welcome to download it and play around with it. And we like to thank the EU for paying our salaries. Uh, and our colleagues from the other DLR institutes uh, who assisted with the, um, the flight uh, measurement campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maitre Suzanne. Nice presentation and nice, yeah. nice overview of your work. So any question? Maybe we can start with the Zoom and the attendees from Zoom. Do not hesitate to raise your hand and you can give you the the, the 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 sound if you need it, or use the Q, uh, Q and R uh, application. So, any questions, comments from Zoom and uh, from the room? Any questions? Yeah, there's one from Zoom talking to maybe Zinan. I don't know if you hear us. Give a the right. Uh, I, I'm hearing you. Do you hear me, please? Yes, we can yes. hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, for, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting um, presentation. Thank you for the organization team. Question is uh, concerning the very interesting uh, tool uh, called the Flexages. That when. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering is if uh, we can uh, simulate the and um, uh, and this, uh, the concentrated the photovoltaics uh, with vestiges or only the classical uh, photovoltaic without concentrator, please. Uh, currently, it only uh, can calculate flat plate PV, so static uh, PV, so also not. Uh, no tracking is installed, is, is integrated. But I think Sorry? it- uh, Please, I, I had a, a problem of connection. Uh, so we, is it possible? Is it possible, please? Yeah, as it is currently is, it, it, uh, it is not possible. But okay. I think it would not be that hard to integrate it. Uh, okay. But it, it would need to be done, so. <laughs> So, it, because in principle, it uses um, the PV lib software uh, to model the PV systems. So, it would be just to add another module to separately calculate such systems additionally. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. But it's a good idea to extend it. <laughs> We maybe we can put it in the next project proposal. <laughs> Good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other comment questions? Yeah, yeah. you mentioned about uh, this uh, 
thousands of elements that you end up uh, to the root. Yeah. What are these thousands of elements? What do you mean by uh, roof elements? Yes. So um, in, in pre it's every roof surface. So uh, like you have a simple uh, roof from a house like you draw as a child, uh, a saddle roof, uh, that has two elements. It has two roof elements. But if you have some... Uh, with the uh, with your roofs orientation. Yeah, if, if you like have an American uh, Mac mansion that has ma already many roof elements because it's a complicated roof shape. Uh, so if you... So if you have a simple roof shape, it's just one or two, a flat roof has one element and uh, a simple saddle roof has two elements. And if you have some extensions on the roof, uh, I don't know the English word for it right now, uh, then you already get more roof elements. Hmm? Complexity on the roof. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you, you have uh, from the earth observation data, from the aspect mainly, you become the direction of the, the rooftop, and from the slope, you get the angle. So minimum you have two, <laughs> maximum you have 10 for one building in the worst case. So, and then it depends what you want to do with the data. Mm. So you, if you expect the PV panels, then might we just can reduce this 10 elements back to one? because it's just covered in one but then we have just one element for the PV existing system but we want to also model what will be the maximum amount you can use so and then you increase the number of, of elements again and mm -hmm. then you need much computation time thank you thank you very much Zan and Jeffo. thank you thank you Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello again, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? It's okay. Yes. Okay. So, so the presentation now is uh, still on the same uh, pilot, and we see some connections and. Uh, by the way, we are doing some co-design between the two sub-pilots to make a merge uh, in FlexiGIS um, to, to provide maybe more details, even more details than CAMS by doing some transformation and downscaling approach that we are proposing in this uh, sub-pilot. So it's, uh, it's about near on the fly service for solar variability assessments and forecasting at urban scale. So I won't go into details uh, because it has been already presented, but the team of uh, this pilot uh, is there with Transvalor, Diala, Armin, and uh, Min Pari. And for the part uh, we are presenting now is based on the Dias uh, Wikio. So um, uh, the, um, we can, just again for context, we have the European Solar Rooftop Initiative that is part of the EU solar energy strategy and, uh, and the plan that have been already presented by Re about Repower EU. So you have the link to, the, to this, uh, to this uh, EU solar energy strategy. And what we can see in this document is that solar rooftop, including residential, public industries and commercials, has the potential of 25 percent of uh, EU's electricity consumption. So it's very, very noticeable and not uh, and uh, relevant to have the solar rooftops um, uh, within Europe. And uh, in this uh, plan, we have uh, an acceleration of the share of uh, clean energy, but in particular, the acceleration of PV rooftop installations uh, with a series of measures that has been uh, proposed um, including, for example, the limit of the length of the permitting, um, the PV photovoltaic compulsory for new buildings, etc. And they, pro they, they have uh, the assumption that for the first year of the implementation of this plan, uh, there will be uh, plus 20 terawatt hour uh, of PV electricity production. And by 2025, uh, plus, let's say, 60 terawatt hour 
um, if you look at the average of the, 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 the ability of the PV to produce any electricity, it corresponds to more or less 60 uh, gigawatt crates, gigawatt peak of PV by 2025. So rooftop will be major development in Europe if you look at the European solar energy strategy. So why photovoltaic uh, rooftop are interest for urban? It's a low cost asset by uh, Jetro. It's a low cost uh, price of electricity and it's constantly uh, decreasing. There is no emission of pollutants or uh, direct, uh, direct greenhouse uh, gas emission during the exploitation of the, the, the photovoltaic systems. There is a production of electricity exactly where the electricity is consumed. The, the, so you have an increase of efficiency for the grid. It adds value to unused urban roof and parking shades and commercial buildings. If you look at the ugly uh, architectures of this type of uh, buildings, so covering with PV is okay. And uh, we can see in some papers that it has a positive impact on urban heat islands, uh, just like uh, also the vegetation coverage of the roof. So having solar cadasters, uh, is good to enable to analyze the solar potential roof and shades for the parking lots um, over our city with respect to the local electricity consumption. So to focus on um, uh, self-consumption and, uh, and uh, con consumption of electricity locally and help public and private decision makers and investors to accelerate the, the PV development. So as an history, since 2016, we have uh, developed with uh, the company Insan We Trust, uh, which was a, a, a new company supported by the French Geographical Institute and uh, SODA, which is uh, uh, based on, on Transvalor, uh, providing some solar data. Um, so they have de developed a free and accurate uh, solar cadaster that you can look at with this link there. And one of the uh, solar, the first, uh, solar cadaster is in Nantes in the south, uh, northwest of France. So you can click on the building and have a very simple, easy to use analysis of the solar potential of a roof and have a connection with PV installer. So it's very goal oriented uh, application of solar cadaster. So our vision that we are trying to bring in this uh, pilot is to go from the static solar cadaster, just a map at high resolution giving you some yearly amount or monthly amount of energy you can get out of your PV system on the roof to a dynamic solar assessment and forecasting at urban scale on the fly. So on the fly means that we have, we will, we will, we are proposing a service that enable to have this on the fly computation of this PV yield and PV variability when you are selecting a region of interest. So we have identified in a co-design analysis uh, uh, at least three use cases in a shape. One is related to one, the one that has been discussed by uh, Jetro and, and Suzanne is about self-consumption for uh, collective or individual uh, uh, people. You can also have a, a support of the PV integration in the electric grid. So, and to be able to simulate PV injection with the variability at different source points of the grid and to see the problem of congestion and, uh, and things like that to uh, be able to, um, uh, to, to, to size the grid with respect different amount of share of PV rooftop you will have on your city. So maybe the target of this uh, of this uh, application is the distribution system operator, just like Enedis in France. And we have also maybe further uh, energy trading, spot markets, uh, uh, looking at portfolio of PV rooftop systems and to be able to forecast the PV production to be able to trade on the electricity market. And for that, you need some forecasting and I will develop all these uh, examples. So, uh, what we are proposing is a solar assessment and forecasting as a service, SAF as. So the idea is to be input agnotism, sorry, I don't know to pronounce this, agnotism 
so with respect to solar data, sorry, the, the solar data, uh, the weather data, the temperature, for example, for the PV system, but also the digital elevation model, the digital surface model, the shape of the city at different scales. Digital surface model is the scale, the higher scale, below one meter resolution, more than, more approximately 10 centimeters is better. And to provide uh, this service as an interoperable standard based on OGC uh, compliance uh, lists um, and web services that will be developed, uh, deployed in a scalable and parallel high power computing cloud infrastructure. So in that case, WKO and be able to uh, use some elasticity possibilities of this cloud to, uh, to scale the possibility of computation with respect to the user need. So I'm using the, what we call the unshaved shell on the fly uh, units uh, computing system. So depending on the number of users, you can uh, start a, a HPC system on the cloud and do the, 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 the computation and then uh, unshave it and stop to pay and stop to consume uh, energy for that. Uh, and for that, we can imagine a variety of access from the web, from desktop application to machine-to-machine -to -machine transactions. And of course, it provides some outputs that is also interoperable and standard uh, based on NetCDF with climate and forecast uh, metadata information. So as depicted by Rodrigo, it's a cloud-based, on-demand, on-the-fly, scalable, and input agnostic system. If you look at the, um, the figures, the idea is, for example, you can go with CAMS radiation provided by the CAMS atmosphere uh, monitoring services. So at a certain level, so we are between three to five kilometers with uh, 15 minutes resolution. And then we are providing a web processing services uh, hosted on the cloud here in WKO. And using digital surface model and digital elevation model, we can provide uh, a downscaling of this time series of irradiance. And it can, it can come from other sources, ERA5 if you want, or local in situ measurements as well. And you get some high resolution at let's say one, minute, one meter resolution, one meter resolution, the time series of irradiance, irradiance. And for that, you can use it for different use cases as listed previously. Uh, here depicted in a, with a Jupyter notebook, for example. Uh, sorry. I, ah, sorry, sorry. It's not here. Up. So the data, data I used in this pilot is Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Services, uh, aerosol, water vapor for the clear sky modeling, and all sky radiation coming from CAMS radiation, looking at the cloud with MeteoSat uh, second generation. We are using uh, uh, SRTM uh, DEM, Digital Elevation Model, decametric uh, modeling of the shape uh, of the mountains and the orography. And uh, here, digital surface model at 10 centimeters coming from, for example, IGN in France. We have a, a global coverage in France uh, with, let's say, 10 to 20 centimeter resolution DSM that we can use with the web map services that are, they are providing. So in an interoperable way. We are investigating also uh, Google Earth uh, data, 3D data that are the very high quality uh, uh, and high resolution, let's say 10 centimeter. And if you look at the coverage of uh, this uh, uh, Google Earth 3D, so these uh, maps depict the proportion of population, not surface, population covered by the Google Earth 3D information. So you can see that in Europe, we are more or less 40% of the population that is covered by 3D information coming from Google. You can look at the Google Earth uh, application and you can see the quality of the shape of the building you can get out of this 3D information and you say, can see the coverage that is not dense everywhere that is focused uh, you can see it on the fly uh, on this map but it is focused on the big cities and more uh, uh, here in the in North uh, America and Europe and by the way the Vatican is the one that is 100% covered. So as a back office, we are using the WKO. So for the computation on the fly with a scalable on the unshelved shelf mechanism with the web processing services and the front office for the moment 
is uh, hosted uh, both in our infrastructure and in WKO with a Jupyter uh, notebook. So for the uh, Copernic, sorry, for the first use case, we are about PV self consumption. We are discussing with a French company, Urban Sync, um, uh, that are interested in this type of uh, uh, analysis at self consumption. So you can select uh, a region of interest, which is not limited to a, a roof. It can be open uh, polygon, uh, for example, focusing on uh, parking for the shading. You can have um, you can put some information from the customers about their energy consumption, for example, in France, coming from Linky or coming from a model, if you have. And then since you have a time series, not just yearly average or monthly average, just like presented by Pietro and you, uh, Susan, you can make some estimation of uh, the self-consumption ratio and self-sufficiency ratio that is very important to understand the, the, the effectiveness of the PV self-consumption in a specific place where you can have some shadow effect, et cetera. So we have done some uh, demonstration uh, of this type of uh, Jupyter notebook, uh, providing some example of using this web pro processing services for the uh, uh, PV self-consumption. So you can have here, and you can here it's not the region of interest. You can select here, uh, uh, a roof, uh, but it can be again uh, open uh, open uh, region of interest. Um, you can select the time series you want and the cover time coverage of uh, your analysis coming from uh, camps. You have a first analysis to select the place. This is the building. You can see that you have two roofs, and here each uh, each square is cor corresponding to one square meter of resolution from this. Uh, computation, but it's not limited. You can go below, but in this example, you have one meter, uh, one square meter resolution. And you can see that this part of the building is interesting for PV development because here it's towards south, whereas the second one is towards north. And then you can select your region of interest where you can put some, imagine to put some PV systems. And then you have the PV simulations. So the time series at a daily basis, Daily profiles and it, it, it is monthly profiles over monthly uh, profiles over uh, different years, and then you can make simulation of self-consumption depending on the the, the, the model of uh, electric consumption. So here you have the electric consumption of your building. You have the part in in red that is provided by your PV system on your roof that you have selected, taking into account the variability and also uh, the shadow effect on the, uh, at urban scale. And in purple, you have the amount of energy that you are selling to the grid because it's, a, it's a, an, a, an excess. It's provided by the PV system, but not use, uh, using, used by, the, um, by the, the building because in that case, you don't have, we don't have simulation of uh, uh, storage. So you have the YouTube, uh, video about this uh, uh, the, this demonstration with Jupyter Notebook, and you can uh, contact Lionel uh, to have some demonstration of this pilot. I want to have an, uh, another um, example of the uh, of uh, about the energy trading with a portfolio of PV system uh, using solar forecasting at urban scale. So it's a coupling between satellite-based CMV forecasting just presented by uh, Stelios with two hours uh, um, maximum of time horizon for the forecast. And uh, this is coming from a paper do, that we have uh, published during this uh, year. And you can go to see this, uh, this materials, scientific materials that is uh, the basis of this uh, coupling between the solar forecasting and the dynamic solar cadaster that we are providing with the web processing service. And the reason why is that you have a building with, uh, and thank you for Rodrigo, thank you Rodrigo for your, your slides. Uh, so you have the, 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 the building inside somewhere in the pixel of three kilometers per three kilometer, because since we have the information of this, uh, uh, these trees that is, uh, that is not this one, but uh, in front of the, of the building, is making some shadow on the PV system. So this can be detected 
with the DSM, then you can simulate what happened at least for this shadow effect, not the cloud effect, but the shadow effect uh, at, this, uh, at this scale. And instead of having this forecast, the probabilistic forecast without taking into account the shadow effect, you can have this shadow effect uh, um, uh, taken, taken into account. And you can see that the, the, since you, don't, you miss some part of the direct components, the shadow effect is less important. And then you have a less uh, uh, uncertainty of the forecast for this uh, period at 10 hours for the two hours ahead. So you can, uh, if you don't have this information coming from these services, you can have an overestimate of between 10 to 100 percent. Thank you, Rodrigo, for these figures. So since you have uh, uh, an application with, uh, for example, here, the possibility for with a, a cell phone application to uh, for the to to sell the surplus of your PV self consumption, you can imagine to have. Uh, um, uh, thanks to the solar forecasting, the possibility to sell uh, at an exact uh, point, uh, looking at the, the forecasting to sell your, uh, what you expect to have a surplus uh, in your uh, PV production. And since uh, we, are, we are discussing, Rodrigo uh, is discussing with a, a, a Portuguese uh, a cooperative, Cooper Nico, and uh, they are interested in using this forecasting ability at urban scale to uh, develop a business. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions. Do not hesitate to raise your hand and I will uh, let you speak as a, as a panelist, if you wish, for the people who are attending. <coughs> okay. I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it's a bit of already getting into the topic of the second part of the event of today. Yeah. But what do you feel it's the impact of new? EO sources uh, for, for for this specific uh, use case. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, as discussed by Suzanne and uh, and Jetro, there are some new coming Earth observation observation system that maybe is uh, is able to see the DSM at the higher resolution. Is for example Pleiad Neo, which is thirty centimeter, but it's not definitely for free. Uh, it's coming from uh, Airbus uh, Industries, so you can uh, imagine that you can derive some high resolution, enough maybe to uh, create at least a DSM, let's say, at 50 centimeter resolution, maybe 60, 60 centimeter, not 10 centimeter. But uh, definitely this type of uh, information is in, in, of interest for covering a new country that, that is not covered, for example, by Google Earth or by the National, uh, National uh, Geographic Institute. Yes, is that? Just a hint to that. Um, you can also use uh, the LOD uh, on the channel sets, what we are testing now. Yeah. Um, there you, if you are able to do that, you can provide also the fact checking in the resolution in the end, just because you have the information inside the, the ship already. And for some kind, in some um, areas in, in Germany, they are provided, yes. But unfortunately, it's not for everything. And you will have also upcoming satellite missions to probably increase the resolution. Thank you. And by the way, uh, for example, in France, uh, IGN, the French National Geography uh, Institute, it has a campaign of uh, high resolution LIDAR. And we are looking at this data that is already uh, available in the um, in An Annecy and in Bordeaux and uh, towards uh, Montpellier. And you can see the, the highest quality you can uh, have compared to the existing uh, DSM from, uh, um, from orthophoto and uh, aerial uh, um, airborne system, at least in France. But if you look at the Google Earth uh, 
3D information, you can see that it's almost the same quality as LiDAR. It's impressive. Yes. OK, thank you, Lionel. Uh, so if we don't have any further question, I suggest we have a coffee break. Um, we are coming back. Um, there is a, a question on the discussion line, no? No. No one raised hand. No QA. Okay. So if you, you like, so uh, we are coming back. So we have uh, 20 minutes, uh, more or less, uh, less than 20 minutes now, sorry. So we are coming back at 11.20 for the second part of the session one with uh, uh, four other uh, pilots. Thank you for uh, your attention and see you soon. I will stop now the, I suspend the, the recording. Hello, Merita. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Nice to. I, I cannot uh, switch on my camera. I don't know if you want that. But, uh, ah, okay, okay. Have Maybe. permissions. Yeah, I can do this permission. I don't know where, but I can do it. Uh, up. Um... Uh, hmm. Sorry, I don't know where to. Okay, it's it's fine for me. Um... for me do you know where we can allow Merito? what if you just click on my uh, on my name or my picture and, and maybe yeah. you'll have some options there i will try so i i stop sharing the the screen for you to share yours first. yeah and then uh, okay discussion I don't have the, this permission. Okay. Maybe, maybe yeah. as an animator, I can. What do you think, uh, Lionel? I, I'm not sure what you try. She wants to. She wants to uh, share the screen. open. No, share the screen should be okay. Can you share your screen first? I'll try that. Yeah. No, c'est la caméra. Elle arrive pas. Elle... Ah, c'est not... la caméra. Ouais. Okay, I, I don't know to open it. It's, it's strange that you don't have the right for doing that. I'll just go with my yeah, picture exactly. then. So you are in That's the... Fine. Uh, okay, you know. Okay, so... Can you see my slideshow now? Uh, for the moment, you are in the presenter mode. And now it's okay. It's good now? Yes. Good. Okay, so... I don't know where to put that. How many people are in the room? Uh, we are seven. Okay. <laughs> and so you have uh, 25 people, uh, 25, 22 yes. people connected. Yeah. So you can, uh, okay, may I talk, please go ahead. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Mireille Becher from the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, we have a pilot called Merging Offshore Wind Products. Actually, as it turns out, it has developed a bit um, since we formulated this title, but I'll get uh, more back to that later on. Um, just to set the scene, uh, we are dealing with offshore wind energy, and we all know that the EU has ambitious targets of being carbon neutral by 2050. There's also a strategy for uh, offshore renewable energy, uh, which states that we need to install uh, several hundreds of gigawatts by 2050 to uh, reach our um, goal of being carbon neutral. And uh, some of this uh, power will be installed in the form of uh, floating offshore wind. 
There's currently uh, 25 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind power installed. Um, it, it's um, 160 wind farms in 12 different countries in the EU. And uh, by 2030, uh, the expectation is there should be 111 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity. So uh, it's a huge and fast increase. And uh, one of the challenges um, in the context of offshore wind energy is, of course, to find uh, the best places at sea to, um, to harvest the wind and also to um, coordinate with other interests uh, in the marine environment. So how can EO help us here? Um, we can first take a look of the different uh, data sources we have uh, available to us. Um, the industry, um, the, the offshore wind industry is um, rather conservative and used to um, installing meteorological masts or lighters in order to make bankable uh, resource assessments. Uh, and I don't think that will change in the near future. Um, the problem with, uh, with um, mast or lighter observations is uh, relatively expensive to make. They are difficult to maintain in the harsh environment offshore. And uh, it becomes challenging when we have uh, water depth uh, beyond 60 meters because uh, uh, bottom fixed installations uh, are difficult. Then uh, the industry also very much relies on numerical weather prediction models. It's very easy to uh, purchase model data. Reanalysis data are uh, readily available for free, but they come at a, a relatively low spatial resolution. But uh, one can order mesoscale uh, model data or down, downscale um, simulations for an area of interest. One thing to remember about model data is that there are uh, estimates, the calculated results, so uh, they don't always show the, the true wind conditions. They, there are issues. Then um, we have huge EO based data sets uh, available to us uh, at no cost. For example, we have uh, everything that Copernicus offers. We also um, uh, in our case, we use uh, mostly synthetic aperture radar data from uh, Sentinel and uh, previous missions. We also have uh, scatterometer wind observations, and there are several other wind types of wind observations available from satellites today. And um, with some of them, uh, especially the SAR, we can achieve a high spatial resolution in uh, the wind fields we can retrieve. Uh, the downside is that the temporal resolution is not so great compared to the other data sources I mentioned before. And uh, most satellite uh, wind retrievals are performed at the level 10 meters above the sea surface. And that's, of course, too low when we are dealing with wind turbines that are maybe 200 meters tall. So uh, an extrapolation exercise is needed in order to estimate the wind speeds at uh, the turbine hop height. So here, just two examples showing uh, the data sets we work with. To the left, you see uh, a wind map, wind map that we have retrieved from uh, SAR imagery. Um, the resolution is so high, so you can see the different uh, wind farms here in the North Sea. They stand out as uh, bright targets or, uh, with high scattering. This has nothing to do with the wind, uh, but it's useful for seeing where the wind farms are. You may also notice that uh, the SAR data covers uh, the uh, coastal zone all the way up to the coastline. And we have uh, performed validation studies in the past that show that it's actually uh, quite accurate, even uh, close to the coastline, uh, except when we have uh, sandbars or mud flats that uh, uh, disturb the picture a little bit. And, uh, but where we have a uh, sea surface, we can retrieve wind speeds with a, a good accuracy. To the right, you see an example of an, a wind field from ASCAT. This is something one can just download uh, readily available, for example, from uh, UMITSAT. And uh, these have a, a much higher temporal resolution than the SAR images we can get. 
Um, one issue with the scatterometer observations is that uh, their coastal resolution, therefore you can see that the, the coastal areas are not well covered because uh, pixels that are mixed land and sea um, are, are removed or masked out from uh, these data sets. So what we are trying to do is to take the best of both worlds, uh, find ways to combine the SAR and ASCAT uh, data and also uh, other types of data, uh, because I, I don't think there's one data set that uh, is the ideal for offshore wind resource assessment or offshore wind energy applications in general. Uh, we have to um, combine different data sets and use uh, hybrid methods. Here's just a few examples of uh, research we have done. Um, here we are at uh, a UK wind farm called uh, Westermost Rough, and the wind is coming from the southwest, so that's the lower left corner of these plots. And uh, the two uh, plots uh, in your higher uh, left corner are based on SAR. So uh, to the left, you have um, just a, a backscatter image from SAR. You can see uh, the wind turbines, and you can also see uh, some dark shadows on the downstream side of the turbines. This is the wake effect, which is um, an effect of uh, the turbines taking energy out of the wind. So uh, the wind speed will decrease as it passes through the wind farm. Um, in the plot B, you can see a retrieved wind field where, again, we can see that the wind speed is uh, reduced downstream of the turbines. And we see this very often, especially for uh, moderate wind speeds uh, on the order of 6 uh, to 8, maybe 12 meters per second, because uh, um, at, at those wind speeds, uh, uh, most of the wind is uh, utilized by the, the wind farm. At higher wind speeds, the, some of the wind will uh, simply penetrate uh, the wind farm, so we cannot detect the, the wake effects uh, quite so clearly. So the two plots uh, in the lower right-hand side of the slide shows uh, ground-based Doppler radar observations. First, uh, just an instantaneous snapshot and uh, then a 10 minute mean value. You can, uh, I think, recognize some of the same signatures. The ground based Doppler radar is uh, much higher resolution than the SAR, but uh, you can see these uh, patterns of the uh, wakes downstream of the wind turbines. And uh, here's an example from the island of, of Crete, where we have uh, to the left a simulated wind field, just an instantaneous uh, wind field uh, simulated with the wolf model, and to the right a snapshot from uh, Sentinel-1. And the wind uh, direction here is uh, coming from the north, and you can see that uh, due to the topography on uh, this island you have different effects, so when the wind is channeled through a, a gap, uh, you get speed up effects, and uh, when you're behind a mountain, you get uh, very significant lee effects. And these effects are visible both uh, in the model data and uh, in the SAR. But I think it's quite clear from this example that you get a lot more detail from the SAR images. You can really resolve um, the, the smaller scale variability in, in these wind fields. Then uh, we have uh, put a lot of effort into creating wind atlases, uh, especially over the European seas. And here are three examples. They are all uh, extrapolated to the height 100 meters to be more uh, useful for, for wind energy applications. And we do this on the basis of um, model data from WOLF. So we can uh, use temperatures and heat fluxes from WOLF to uh, estimate a stability correction and apply that to uh, the logarithmic wind profile, which is uh, a description of how the wind uh, increases with height. So um, you can perhaps just at a first glance see that these three maps are, are fairly similar. You see that the high wind areas to the north uh, are visible uh, in all three maps. The coverage is a little bit different uh, for the three data sets, but uh, I think you get the idea. You can also see in the Mediterranean that uh, the general wind speed um, on average is lower than in northern Europe. Uh, and you can see different features, for example, the mistral winds uh, of France and there are other uh, effects that uh, are seen in all three maps. 
perhaps you can also see that the, the mean wind speed map generated from SAR in the middle has more detail than the other two maps. So the kind of detail we can get from scatterometers and from uh, wolf modeling is uh, similar, whereas the SAR can provide uh, a lot more uh, spatial detail in the maps we create. So to make our uh, huge archive of SAR wind fields available to users, both in the industry and, and from academic, academia, we have created this uh, portal. It's part of a, a larger portal called uh, the Scientific Global Wind Atlas. So there are many different data sets on this portal, but um, one page is dedicated to uh, the SAR wind fields we uh, create. And uh, we download new Sentinel data every day from uh, Copernicus and uh, retrieve the wind speeds. Um, we use um, an algorithm called CMOD 5N to do the wind retrieval. And um, we do it in near real time. So one can find uh, the latest wind maps on this uh, portal within um, roughly 24 hours of the data acquisition. So we do this, that routinely for the European seas and uh, users can browse colorful maps uh, in PNG format. That's kind of what you see here. Uh, it's also possible to register and download the net CDF files behind uh, these colorful plots. And we use this a lot also in our teaching activities at our university. For example, we have a, a remote sensing summer school where I, we have a, a class on uh, using the SAR wind fields. And it's quite handy then that the, that the students can access the archive easily like this. Then um, uh, when it comes to wind atlases, so the generation of uh, mean wind maps and uh, other maps that describe the, the uh, average wind conditions, we have a, a page on the same portal where uh, the scatterometer based and the SAR based uh, uh, resource maps can be found. Since there are so many samples available from uh, scatterometers, we can uh, resolve the annual mean wind speeds and uh, um, estimate the annual uh, power production. Uh, unfortunately, this is not really possible to do from SAR because the number of samples we have uh, for a given year is simply not high enough. So you need uh, something like uh, at least a thousand samples to, to estimate the, the wind power density with um, sufficient uh, confidence. And uh, that's only possible for the scatterometer data at the moment. So um, as was mentioned in some of the earlier presentations, an, an important part of the eShape project has been uh, to perform co-design with the end users. And we have selected three different uh, companies to work with, and we have interviewed them um, early on in the project, listened to their requirements. Uh, here's a, a representative from the company C2Wind, a consultancy company, and um, they explained how they would use uh, satellite-based wind maps. Uh, they would uh, like to use it as a supplement to the other uh, data sets they have in their hands and use them to understand how representative a, a LIDAR or a mask measurement is, because typically you only have a measurement at one point location. So what if you want to investigate a larger area around that location? For that, the, the satellite data can be uh, very useful, they thought. Uh, C2Wind also asked for coverage outside Europe because there are some hotspots where offshore wind energy is really uh, booming at the moment, for example, in the US and in uh, Southeast Asia. And they requested information about uh, the atmospheric stability because they were a bit concerned about the accuracy of the wind retrievals we can perform. So if we could uh, add information about uh, temperature or, or the wind profile, uh, they would be able to use the data sets with more confidence. And uh, the last thing C2Wind asked for was uh, better documentation. So it's easy to, uh, to use our data and understand the, the shortcomings. For example, uh, there can be artifacts in the, in the SAR images that are inherited in the wind fields. And they would like to uh, know about such things. 
Um, and that's a general thing we see from the industry that uh, it's very important for them to understand the nature of the data sets. And we also uh, see, or we've seen over the years that there's quite a steep learning curve when it comes to working with EO data. So uh, it's not so easy for the industry to uh, implement EO-based data because they, they uh, feel they don't have a good understanding of the, the nature of the data sets. Another company we worked with is uh, Vortex. Uh, that's a provider of model data. And it's a, a provider that's very uh, widely used by the wind industry. So in a way you can say we are competitors because we are both uh, distributors of data to the wind industry. Um, but we chose to uh, work together because uh, uh, Vortex can see value in, um, in uh, comparing their model uh, estimates with SAR wind maps. So we have, um, since we uh, talked to them, we have exchanged uh, some uh, satellite data. Uh, they were in particular interested in looking into extreme wind events where the models don't perform as well as uh, they would like. So they have used satellite data to uh, validate the, the model outputs. Nareto, less, less than one minute, please. Okay, I'll uh, go quickly. Through and I think uh, again, Vortex asked for more guidance, more explainers, and also for time series measurements. The third company we talked to was Equino. They had similar requ requirements. They also asked for combined wind and wave uh, products, which we'll see if we can uh, deliver in the future. So, um, up till now, we have improved our documentation pages significantly based on the user feedback. We've added uh, short video demos to get them started on using the data sets. We've also expanded our area of interest. So we used to only cover the European seas, but now we've added the east coast of the US and the Great Lakes, and also the seas of Southeast Asia. So it's a massive, uh, huge areas we have added. Um, and uh, we have set up our system to handle the large amounts of data that come in every day and need to be processed. So just to summarize, uh, the huge advantage of EO wind fields is that they're available for more than 20 years back in time. So there's no need for, to wait for data collection. They uh, offer higher spatial resolution than uh, standard mesoscale models, at least the, the SAR data and a large uh, spatial coverage. And uh, the downside is the temporal sampling, as uh, I mentioned before, but we are actually getting up to uh, numbers like 3000 SAR samples for locations in Northern Europe. So it's getting better and better all the time. And we have ways to extrapolate the 10 meter measurements or 10 meter um, estimates of the wind fields to uh, higher levels. So we believe, and also our users believe, that there is a, a basis for uh, for using satellite winds for uh, uh, in connection with the installation of in situ measuring stations and um, in connection with validation of numerical simulations for analysis of wind farm wakes and uh, perhaps also in the end for decision making in the context of wind farm planning. That was it. Thank you. Nice and impressive presentation. Thank you, Merita. Uh, any question from Zoom? No. Uh, from the room? Yes, Thierry? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Merita, for your presentation. Uh, just a quick question about um, uh, the condition that will make uh, your your work um, uh, accept as uh, being a, a, a support for the development of uh, of uh, of uh, wind uh, offshore uh, by the company. What will be the, the key element that will change their view on the, on on your job and uh, that will support really uh, the development of offshore energy? I think it's actually um, the documentation or the so making it easy to use the data. That's what we heard from all three users. They, they find it difficult to get started. They can see that the images are nice, but they would like some uh, help or, or some uh, easy way into the 
to uh, using the data and also to understanding these uh, shortcomings that I, I mentioned. They're, they're a bit afraid of um, misinterpreting the images. So we should help them as much as we can with, with understanding the data. We'll try to do that by uh, implementing quality flags in our data files. Thank you very much. No other comments or questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Many question uh, if I understood things correctly. So the sketchometer that uses uh, uses um, indirectly the wave height to uh, determine the wind speed. Is that correct? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't explain the the principle so well. But the principle is that both for SAR and scatterometer that. Um, the instruments are sensing the small scale waves at the sea surface, and these waves are generated by the instantaneous wind stress over the, the sea surface. So there are algorithms available to us to, to connect the, the radar backscatter that is measured from the satellite to the wind speed at 10 meters. This is all based on empirical uh, modeling, so, so this relationship is well established empirically and then when you want to get to a hub height because you want to have a wind turbine of 1500 or 200 meters high how do you that's the relevant quantity for developers so do you use then major scale models to uh, imply some vertical profile or how does that work we um, we first convert the 10 meter wind speed to um, to use star, the fr friction velocity. So we have a satellite-based friction velocity. That's the wind speed at, at the lowest possible level. Then we apply a standardized um, vertical wind profile, logarithmic wind profile, but we add a correction for atmospheric stability. And that's very important, and that's what makes it challenging. Uh, it's very easy to, to use a logarithmic wind profile without stability, but adding the stability correction is a little bit more complex. And for that, we use model data. So we use uh, heat fluxes and temperatures uh, from the Wolf model to estimate this uh, stability correction. And then we can predict the wind speeds at all different levels. Okay, thank you very much. That helps. <laughs> thank you, Milita. Um uh, maybe it's time for uh, Thorsten to uh, to to share uh, his screen. Now the the camera is uh, open for uh, looking at, at your at your face. So okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Clear and loud. Okay, and I hope that you can see my screen also. Yes, perfectly. So I will talk about a service which we have called the Windsides, which has been developed in an innovation partnership and then has been further reshaped and refined in the eShape project. Uh, it's about how to use satellite data for improving wind resource estimation, mostly onshore sites. Uh, so um, we set out to develop this in an innovation partnership uh, almost four years ago uh, with the aim to create high quality cost efficient information that could improve wind resource estimation. So this was uh, targeting the wind resource modelers who used um, uh, satellite data as input to their uh, wind models and aiming to improve their input products to achieve, achieve better output products. And with better output products, I mean better estimates of wind resource estimation. If you improve the wind resource estimation, you can save a lot of money and you can save a lot of costs simply by having a, a lower error on your wind resource estimation that allows the wind, um, the wind developers to, to price and, and choose their uh, wind turbines better. And therefore, it's, it's a, a, a good market to be in. So uh, we developed this already back from 2017 to 2020 in a three-year uh, project with Vestas, Wadenfeld, EMD, and uh, DTU Wind, actually together with Mar Marede, who just have given this talk. 
And uh, we continued uh, looking at these products in the E-Shape project with our partner also from the DTU Wind Energy. So uh, we, as I just said, we wanted to analyze what kind of input layers can be used to improve the uh, wind resource estimation. And what we found out is that there are uh, a number of uh, satellite-based uh, input data that can be used to uh, improve wind resource estimation. And we analyzed um, existing data being used in wind resource estimation and found out that there are basically five kinds of uh, products that, that are, are used in, uh, in wind resource estimation that we could improve in this uh, innovation partnership. So one of them is, is uh, standard land cover from, from, uh, from satellite data. A lot of you know these land co cover data also. We were in dialogue with the industry to see what kind of classes is needed in this land cover and how can we improve the automation of this to, uh, to be more cost effective towards uh, the uh, wind resource modeler. We also looked into uh, estimating forest height and density. This is actually where we spent most of our R&D effort was into uh, looking into forest height and density. And then we also uh, uh, used this, the long archive of satellite data to go back and look uh, at historical and maybe also predict future changes on uh, wind uh, mast sites, wind turbine sites. And then finally, we looked at very high resolution elevation layers and used a combination of all these data to look at advanced surface roughness models also. So those are sort of the five uh, categories and I'll walk you through those five categories, categories and also explain you where we stand now with, with, with the, this service and, and how we have used the eShape project to, to get in contact with um, a lot of uh, end users and discuss our service offering uh, with them. For the land cover, what we have uh, produced here is uh, a service that is more or less automated. Uh, it allows to, 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 um, to deliver uh, um, specified uh, land cover classes that are needed in wind, model, wind modelers. What was traditionally used was sort of standard available uh, land cover, like the Korean land cover, where there are a number of classes and what the wind resource modelers then would have to do was to sort of convert these classes into something that their um, uh, tools could be reading. So what we have worked with is what kind of classes are needed uh, to to do this. I won't spend a lot of time on this because it's it's basically just a land cover. There's not uh, much technology going into this, but but it's has been interesting to discuss this with the industry also. So the satellite image we, we use as base are the Sentinel, the Copernicus um, uh, Sentinel data. And uh, here's an example of, uh, of the kind of products we would deliver to the industry here. So these are a basic land cover product. We find that there's most interest from the industry in developing these kind of products over land in forested areas. So that's, that's why we show you this uh, picture here also with, uh, with the forested area. And the reason for this is that the forested um, areas, they are most turbulent in terms of the near surface winds. And this is most important for the wind developers to assess uh, the, uh, the wind patterns over the forested areas. Uh, or most complex to estimate the wind patterns, patterns over these forested areas. Um, we spend a lot of time on developing a machine learning approach to develop forest height and density. And we came up with the model we call the Windside model, which is a sort of low cost and fast delivery still based on, uh, on uh, Sentinel um, data. Uh, allowing us to get with a vertical accuracy of plus minus three meters in elevation for, for estimating forest height also. We also um, have a very high resolution model, which takes uh, some more effort to develop and, and deliver since it's based on, on a high uh, optical uh, satellite data. So uh, basically the forest height looks something like this also. It's just from the same area also. It shows you the granularity of, of, of these forest height uh, data uh, that we have developed. And this has actually generated quite some interest in the industry that we are able to 
to compute this. Um, we are and have been together with DTU when been assessing how does this uh, kind of input data affect the error estimates and of these wind resource estimation because this is what what all the developers are, are after to look how can these input data lead to better estimates of the uh, wind uh, wind uh, resource estimations the amount of available uh, wind uh, so um, we also have developed a density model for, for these forests, the leaf area index model. Um, and all this uh, we can sort of routinely deliver all, uh, with um, estimates of accuracy and uh, are in dialogue with uh, a number of the bigger uh, wind um, companies that uh, have these kind of uh, products. Um, I'll get back to where we stand with, with the delivery of these service products later also. Um, so, one interesting thing about working with satellite data is that you have the ability to go back in the archive to see what has uh, happened at a certain site. This is actually very interesting for the wind industry also because they have uh, a long uh, uh, project lifetime in when they set up uh, the sites, when they build the turbines and when they take mass measurements to estimate the wind. So sometimes you're in a situation where they have a long time project where they have taken wind estimates maybe five, 10 years ago, and then they want to see what was the uh, uh, site conditions back then. And there you have the ability of satellite uh, images to, to analyze uh, what the historical land trends were, what has happened at that site, and give the wind models an estimate of um, how these uh, sites have changed over time. What has it meant that there has been a forest clearing uh, in, for instance, in 1988? How would that have affected the wind pattern? And can you use these kind of images and maps to project what the future is gonna be looking like also? That of course depends on a, on a number of things also, for instance, uh, what, are, are, what are the filling plants in that area and what happens um, uh, on a side level in terms of local decisions also, but there are some trends that can be used here and these kinds of information can be useful, useful for the wind industry because it tells a picture of how that site will produce winds in year to come also. So this kind of information is, 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 is interesting for the wind resource model also. Um, finally, I'll talk a little bit about the very high resolution layers also. Um, there we are using uh, the, the very high resolution optical data to, to get one meter resolution elevation and topography. Uh, this is uh, looking something like this. You have a, a high resolution satellite image, which can be converted into a digital surface model, a terrain model, and then finally be used to, to get the surface height if you subtract these two uh, layers from each other. So uh, there you are able to get into an even higher accuracy in, in terms of your products also. And this is uh, also very interesting for, for some uh, um, wind pro projects where it's extremely important for them to know exactly what goes on on the side. The white dots you see here are actually uh, wind turbines. Uh, um, and as you can see, having an, a very detailed um, information about the um, elevation is, is uh, in this case very important. And uh, what these kinds of products are also are important for is simply that you get down to an accuracy using satellite-based data that is comparable with LIDAR data also, airborne LIDAR data. And this is uh, also interesting for the industry. When does it, uh, when is the cost benefit ratio good? Uh, enough compared to the cost benefit ratio for using lighters. Uh, it costs quite a lot to send up a, a plane, but there you get sort of centimeter accuracy. Can it in some cases be okay to use one meter um, a vertical satellite based um, uh, information uh, to, and these are the kind of discussion we will be having with the industry in, in, in the years to come. And, and uh, I can say this is a, a, a long uh, 
debate uh, with uh, with uh, the companies, trying to convince them what can be used and and uh, explain them what are the benefits for them and when should they be using these data. This is um, something that we'll be working working on in 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 the years to come. So I also wanted to make you aware that uh, there are uh, something called surface roughness. This is a, a physical measure for for what is this uh, sort of surface roughness. And this is something that the wind modelers can directly input into uh, to, to their models. And again, together with DTU Wind, we have been looking at this and um, uh, been able to, to utilize our sort of uh, forest high data, our density data to convert this into a physical measure for the surface roughness also. And some clients, they prefer to get the forest density, forest density and height products delivered um, directly. Some would like just the surface roughness input to their models. So this is again, something that we are trying to figure out what kind of wrapping of our products is needed. Do they need this uh, more sort of uh, derived map in terms of surface roughness or do they need the forest height, forest density products? So uh, to give you an example, why is it that this is important and why do we um, uh, create um, uh, value for the clients? And I think this paper that has been co-written by us and, and uh, uh, written by uh, Roche Flo from DTU Wind Energy actually proves why it has been important for us to work in this domain also. These, uh, the top uh, plus you see here are the standard input products from Green into the wind models. And as you see down here, this is our uh, sort of derived uh, uh, surface roughness products from, uh, from our innovation partnership. And uh, here you have the comparable LIDAR scans uh, that shows you that what we derive is comparable with LIDAR also. And what is normally put in the A, B, C, and E are actually sort of uh, almost nonsense data for, for these forests at sites also. But the big question is, of course, uh, does these input data, do they make a difference in terms of uh, wind predictions? And um, we, we think they do. We have tested this on eight sites. We still have to do this on, on much more sites. But what you see in this plot is the RMS era of the wind uh, energy production. And there you have um, uh, the error going down from using standard uh, input layer into using Sentinel-based um, uh, approaches to these uh, surface roughness. So this is where um, where we are are right now. We are in in a in a in a, in a dialogue with. Um, with I won't go into this, uh, but we are in a dialogue with the industry now with different companies on how to utilize these products. And I think what they are mostly after is this kind of information. What kind of value does it mean and what does it mean to bring down the error prediction of the wind um, resource? Um, and um, this is, as I said, in the eShape project, we interviewed 15 to 20 companies and try to show them the products and, and they all have various uh, inputs and we are now trying to reshape this into a, a new service offering and, and, and new wrapping and um, it will take some years because this before this becomes industry standard, but uh, this plot, I think, shows that there is uh, certainly something to come for and that uh, better input data actually also can achieve uh, better output results. So I'll leave it um, with this and uh, ask if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Tarsten. So do we have uh, any question remotely? Actually, I have one, uh, Thorsten. Yeah. About the the the, the forest uh, density and height that you have uh, presented. So yeah. you are targeting the, the the wind energy, but do you think that this type of product can be of interest as well for the the health monitoring of the forest and for the biodiversity and uh, maybe for uh, even for biomass? Do you? Yeah this type of uh, extended application of such products? 
I think that's a very good point and very interesting also. And we are actually looking to see if we can uh, team up with somebody who um, who knows how to do develop forest uh, carbon uh, maps also. And um, there is um, models for sort of relating forest height with um, above ground biomass. Uh, so this is, is certainly a, an op uh, an option for us to look into this also. And I also know that that your area of uh, solar energy is also of interest in terms of surface roughness. We had a company explaining us that, um, uh, or, or, it, or I heard this in a dialogue somewhere that um, the, the solar panels are in risk of having shorter lifetime if there's a lot of tur turbulent complex wind at the solar sites also. Yeah. So um, uh, describing this um, pattern or phenomena to the people investing in a solar um, uh, panel farm could be of relevance also. But this is again a, a new market and it takes time to sort of uh, penetrate this and, and make uh, people aware of this. And we haven't had the, the time and resources to look into this, but, but this kind of products is, is definitely of interest uh, more places. Yeah, I, I can confirm that because we are developing uh, emerging uh, sun solar tracking system uh, that is um, that are less uh, that are more sensitive to wind, and, uh, and you also the agri voltaism also which uh, uh, will propose some structure that is uh, high above the, the the terrain, and they are very sensitive to wind as well. So okay. This type of uh, new uh, ways of implementing solar uh, solar system um, creates some vulnerability with respect to winds. So this is definitely of interest. Ah, uh, that's good to hear. And and uh, if we had more time, I really would like to understand this also in terms of uh, uh, what's the market for this and how would you get that out and and um, and, I, and I hope we get time to to discuss this also. Um, so uh, thanks for your attention, all, all of you, and, and I'll stop sharing here, uh, Philippe, if that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you very much again, Thorsten. And now it's the time for uh, Leopold from Novelties. So maybe you are, if you are here. Mr. Trasa, are you there? The mic is off. Is a part of the panelist, I think. Okay. So he's not there for the moment. So I propose to switch to uh, if it's okay for uh, Luisa. Um, uh, we will switch. Yep. Waiting for Leopold afterwards. Is that okay for you, Luisa? No, no, no worries. Okay, good. I'll, I'll do my best. So I'll try to, to project. So you can share the image. Screen. Yep. Share. Let's try to see if it works. Do you see my screen? For the moment, we see your presenter uh, ed edition. Yes, it's okay. Uh, so it, it, do you see it? Yes, it's okay. Okay, so let's start. Thank Today, you. can you hear me well? Yes, perfectly. I'm sorry, I will, so just a moment. The office is, is almost empty, so we'll try to, to improve the, the sound. Okay, so let's go. What I'm presenting, I'm Luisa Serra and um, uh, I work in the Portuguese electrical utility in an R&D department of EDP, and I'm presenting you the project Silvanus. Silvanus is the H2020 project that was awarded, and we are more than uh, we are 49 partners, uh, and we have uh, we are we have many partners from Europe, but also from other continents. And the, the Sylvanus project has uh, the main main objective of um, prevent, manage, and restore um, 
from wildfires. And so that's why we have gathered um, a huge group of uh, universities, of uh, companies, uh, even fire departments. And um, that's what I'm presenting to you today. What Sylvanus does is that in three main phases, being the, the phase A, the, the prevention from, from the wildfire, the phase B, the detection and response, and the phase C, the restoration, what we aim to do in a very integrated way by a platform is to integrate components that usually they didn't, they weren't used to speak among themselves. Meaning that you, you, each one of the players and each one of the problems is very developed in, in a vectorial way, but their integration is really not um, very much developed. And that's what Sylvanus really aims to do. And to do this, this platform will integrate uh, heter heterogeneous data sources, heterogeneous conceptual problems, um, many different partners. And in the end, it will um, agilize a system in which the, the, the wildfire prevention, uh, fighting and uh, meeting and uh, how do you say recuperation uh, on the landscape will be much easier. So I will not go very much into the, the detail. This is the one in which I will spend uh, slightly more time because in the end, if you want, we can share the, the presentation and the, the Sylvanus innovations, the, they are spread through the three phases and also uh, including the, 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 the ecological modelings. And in the fire danger rating, what we aim to do by using the platform is to use the fire ignition models and develop self-assessment toolkits that enable a very quick uh, assessment and response to all situations, being there the ongoing fire, but also on ex and phases or recuperation phases uh, after the fire. And this, this, um, this, this platform and the, the fire danger ratings, what they will do, they will enable more players to come into the, the problem solution and a, a better way to articulate among all of ourselves. And so I've, I've got in the presentation, the details we will have training with virtual reality toolkits that will enable the, the firefighters to uh, do the, 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 the tryouts before going into the real scene. And this is very important in countries on the southern of Europe, in which during the, 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 fi the, the, the fire season, we place fire, firemen and firewomen, fire people from one region to the others. And one of the greatest handicaps is that sometimes they don't know what will be the physical reality that they will encounter. Everything else is normalized and it's very standardized, no worries, but the physical landscape can shape the way the fire progresses and the way we should fight the fires. And it's very important for them even when they are um, en route to go to, 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 to fight the fire, to do some, some, um, some training in order to be much better prepared. Then there is a, a huge connection among the platform and the citizen, uh, and the, the citizen framework so that all citizens can, can access the information, but also uh, build up this information. And even from a um, uh, prevention and fighting and restoration perspective, the data that we'll gather from the, the, the social, the social uh, media will help us um, to, be to, to, to better develop the models in order to fight uh, the, the wildfires. So these heterogeneous data sources will be most useful. And in, in, in even still during phase A, the legal issues are very important because sometimes we've got the technical uh, the, the technical solutions. We've got the, the, the stakeholders engagement, but there are some uh, non-alignments with the law that must be rectified in order to guarantee that this is a fluid process and uh, an efficient one. The detection and response, it's, it's very much related with very early detection, 
Um, this will be done in a computational way using data from both UAVs and the ground ones. Um, and also this will be uh, developing a system that will help uh, fire people to be uh, able to more effectively fight the fire. Restoration and adaptation, it, it's, it, it will be using innovative sol solutions uh, based in natural systems. Uh, and this is, is very important in order to guarantee a very fast recuperation of the landscape. We also be using biodiversity models, ec ecological modeling, uh, forest grown uh, models. Um, and in the end, we, we will be issuing policy go and governance recommendations. And we will use also a very, um, very interesting ecological forest models. How will this be done? We've got the Sylvanus platform and we will be having three layers of processing in the cloud, in the near edge and on the far edge. And in each different layer, the information will be, it will be structured, will be integrated and will be uh, digested in order to guarantee that the platform can work <clears throat> and develop the, the solutions that it, it aims to. Uh, the pilot, we, we I work in the Portuguese pilot. We have pilots all over Europe, in Portugal, in France, in Italy, uh, in Greece, um, in Slovakia, also outside Europe, in Brazil, Indonesia, and Australia. And in all of them, we will be uh, developing these phases and demonstrating them. Um, and now collecting now connecting the Sylvanus with the, the special problem of electrical grids because I'm, I'm from the Portuguese electrical utility. So what we are going to do is that we are going to complement the ongoing projects that we already have regarding data collection and um, asset um, protection and asset risk management, and in which we already use some of these tools, but this project will do it in an integrated way, namely using satellite data, using the UIVs with the LIDAR, for example, example, LIDAR information um, and social media. And this will enable us to develop a fire danger index that can be applied to energy, but not on, to the energy business, to the energy assets, but also to the water assets. This is very focused on the main utilities. And we aim with this, keep the pace uh, of reduce, reducing the maintenance costs because we already are achieving this maintenance cost reduction. And we want to build up more knowledge about uh, fire risk on critical assets. And in this project, what we will be doing that it's completely different from, from what we have been done, uh, we have been doing in EDP is in our, my company is that we will be gathering in a very close, we are working already in a very close collaboration with the other partners to solve a problem in which we were used to think on our own. Now we are doing it in a very integrated way and also seeing other perspectives and uh, getting other inputs. And this is uh, so far being very fruitful. Uh, and this is what we, we are doing. And this is the team uh, in one of the last meetings that we had of physical and of virtual. And now I would like to, 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 to see if you have any questions and if you want to, to have more clarification on, on this project. Thank you very much, Luisa. Um, different types of projects focus on fire, but you can see that indeed there are some connection and uh, as I said during the introduction, um, EO can serve the renewable energy not only on the, on the sources, but on the way you are transporting the electricity and other applications. So this is indeed very interesting. Um, maybe some, uh, some questions. Yes, when I go in the, in the room. Um, I always, as a person, I invite to you, first of all, thank you for accepting the invitation to be here today. Yeah, by the way, yes. Okay, can you talk louder? Sorry. Yeah, yes, come on. The first time I heard that you don't hear you. 
both right here. Um, so as the person who invited you, first of all, thank you for accepting to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I was just interested, it, it got in my mind when you, in the beginning you mentioned uh, heterogeneous different data. And uh, if you could just say some kind of share a bit of your experience with having to handle this, uh, the, uh, I got curious. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And also thank you for the invitation. It is an honor to be here. Um, what we are doing is that we are dealing with the fact that we, in order to have, a, to have better models and better information to support decision regarding fire uh, prevention, fire fighting, and, and also the recuperation of the landscape, what we, we need to do is that we need to integrate data sources that are not from the same family. So the, as knowledge evolves regarding uh, big data processing, we have many years ago passed the phase in which we were dealing with only one data family and we would analyze it and have the very good insights on it, but it would be, um, a, a type of a data. Now, what we are doing is that we are get, get we are starting to integrate uh, the the data that we got from the social sources. This, uh, you know, the, the the like Twitter and so on, with other kinds of that data, the meteorological uh, data, the data that we are collecting via IoT on on the. Um, on our assets, but also on the demo, that it's a demo that is already using agriculture 4.0. So we are, we have, it's it's a, a demo with the Lauren uh, Grid network that is in in a, at a at a very extent using IoT to to control agricultural. Um, production and that's it's in this demonstrator that we are now developing the solutions that will integrate all these three main vectors the water utilities the energy utilities and also the agricultural production and the idea that we are starting to to work with the different kinds of systems to address complex problems this is the way to move forward, meaning that we cannot be blind to the data that we've got on other parallel systems, systems that are that exist um, at the same time as the ones that we used to, to, to use that, that weren't using heter heterogeneous data sources. What we are now doing is we are working on the data digestion, on the requisites, on the requirements definition, and also on the kind of um, algorithmics and um, process that we can apply to these data sources in order to have better answers to our problems. And uh, so far, not within Sylvanus project, but with other projects in my company, we have been successful. For example, what we have done is with electrical lines, we have identified um, the lines that are more critical from the operation perspective. And then we had made a, a thorough analysis on them in order to guarantee that the, the vegetation that surrounds the, the the lines, even the, this vegetation is managed, but it, it must be um, cut periodically. So we have created a system that uh, intersects the, the, the information on the vegetation that exists there now, the weather, it predicts how it will evolve and it optimizes the, um, the cutting process, the maintenance, the lines maintenance process. And we have reached uh, considerable savings and improving the, the service. And this is what, it's really interesting. And for example, for these lines project that we have done internally, we are using more than eight data sources. So, and we were able to do it and to integrate it. So, and in Sylvanus, we want to contribute to that, but with, uh, uh, a bigger 
uh, data, uh, more data sources to, imp to increase the, um, the information that we are able to digest. We don't want to put everything in the models, we don't do it. So we have, a, a, we, we start from a huge amount of uh, inputs that we can use and we test to see which ones are relevant. And then these are the ones that are used uh, in more detail in our, in our models. We, this is not, the idea is not to make an over digestion of data. It's just to use the necessary and sufficient data for us to achieve our objectives and to be um, as efficient as possible. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah. If you have more questions, I, I'm happy to, to, to answer. Actually, I have one more, Lisa. Uh, you, you said that uh, you're interested in uh, the vegetation that can be a source of danger for the line, electric line. But in reverse, do you see also the problem of the line itself that creates the problem of fire, the risk of fire, and uh, including the, you know, the high dynamic range is it the HDR, um, the HDR well, If you want, you can speak in French. Yes. The, the, the relationship between the shape of the line and the, the power that, that is transmitted towards this, uh, through this line, and the possibility of touching the ground, even sometimes yep. the, the yep. line. Yep, uh, we, we, we have been working with models uh, for many decades, uh, the company for, for, for many decades, and uh, most of us that uh, work with these models for some dec decades. What happens is that we have the models for uh, a common situation. So we have them, and in common situations, we know how the, the, the shape of the line behaves in regard of temperature, of the winds, and so and so on forth. What we have been doing some years now is that due to climate change and, and to natural, very, how do you say, uh, very out of the normal events, what we have been doing is that we have been applying stress tests and, and uh, extreme um, situation scenarios to all our assets. Why? Because we had uh, uh, we had some events in in some years ago in Portugal. Some uh, in some situations we 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 had some uh, uh, we call it tropical tempests that came through the through the Atlantic Sea, and it it, it was uh, very uncommon for them to reach Europe. But the fact is that they, now they are reaching Europe. And so we had to, to adapt our, our business in order to guarantee that we could keep on serving the clients. Because in some events, some years ago, the first, the first ones that, uh, um, in, in, that we have suffered, it wasn't very easy because no one was prepared for this change of, of paradigm. What we have done so far is that we have learned with all, with all of them. And now we, we have uh, identified what, what are the key aspects that we must, must address in each, in each systems to guarantee that in a very extreme situation, our populations don't, uh, we don't, um, how do you say, we don't fail on them from the supply perspective. From, in order to guarantee that, we have to guarantee the lines, for example, but also the, the substations and the, the, the power plants and the hydro plants and the, the, the renewable plants, we have to guarantee their integrity. And in order to guarantee their integrity, we, we run models on all our assets in order to see what happens in these kind of extreme events. <clears throat> and having identified that, we can even say that here, this line has some redundancy, so we can um, absorb the risk of having the line being destroyed. But what we never, uh, we never, we never accept is that we can cause risk either on assets, other assets from, from other, other players, other, either on people. So in all situations that in a very, very, very complicated scenario, in extreme, we could, we could run into a situation in which we would be causing the fire, we 
we apply all the measures. Just to give you a, a, an example, there have been some very harsh wildfires in Portugal, but in all of them that have been investigated, we have never been the cause. And the, the idea is that we don't want to be the cause. We, that's the, 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 that's a red line as we have strict red lines and this is one of them. And if it, if it costs more, no worries, we will send the teams more often there to cut the trees or we can even change the line. It has already occurred, but we, we don't want to be the cause. It's a red line. But we, we run the stress tests. That's how we do it. We study the lines, we run the stress tests. We have learned a lot with past events. Uh, if you want one day, we can make a session on the past events and the lessons learned. And just to give you an idea, as of today, <clears throat> if something extreme happens, we, we can, uh, how they say, recuperate service in a very, very short notice. So we have really improved the, the processes and learned a lot. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so I think that we will uh, uh, go to the next and uh, um, last presentation uh, for this uh, uh, session one of this morning. So Leopold, now you are here. Can you, uh, Lisa, can you stop sharing your screen? I want, but I, I'm not, um, I want, but I, I don't know very much. Okay. I can, I can stop for you, I think. Uh, no, I can stop for you. Uh, it's here, it's here. Sorry, I was looking on. I'm very sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you again, Lisa. No, no it's time to Leopold. Thank you. Mr. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we are in, and we are looking at your Green. edition mode of your. Yes, it's okay. Perfect. So thank you very much for uh, being, uh, being there to, to present one of our services uh, by Novelties. Um, and I will first uh, start by uh, introducing a bit Novelties. We are a SME, French SME, uh, with more than 20 years of experience right now. And we are on to 40 employees based in Toulouse. So why Toulouse? Because uh, core business of Novelties is dedicated to upstream earth value chain designing the future um, observation mission. And uh, we have been involved in the preparation of uh, satellite mission by working on their uh, specification, algorithm design, um, calibration and processing of their data. So we have consequently built a, quite a strong relationship with a, a French uh, space agency, but also European, European space agency, uh, even the, the American one, NASA, and uh, we have collaborated on, other, on a lot of international projects. Um, so we are involved uh, in many different sectors and we have developed some different um, um, products and services for this, uh, this different sector. So space, of course, I, I told you, but also in environment, uh, sustainable development, uh, which is part of, uh, of what I, which I would present uh, today, and also uh, risk prevention. So we talk about a bit earlier about forest fire, and we did some, uh, some product uh, about it to, to prevent uh, forest fire as well. Uh, but uh, we are here to talk about uh, tidal prediction system, uh, which is uh, our tidy uh, services. Um, so basically, we have been developing some global and regional tidal atlases for the French Space Agency since 2008. Um, and then talking to industrial clients, we noticed that tides were really of interest in a lot of marine uh, application. Uh, so we start focusing on renewal, uh, marine renewable energy that gets more and more attention, as you can see, <laughs> uh, and more investment uh, as part of the blue growth in, in Europe. Uh, so tides, in our case, uh, could be considered as a fuel of uh, tidal turbines. And we were, so there was a need for uh, a resource assessment to, to be able to, to, say, to see and to, to monitor what are the best places, spots in the world where uh, tidal turbines could, could be of interest, uh, not only on research uh, point of view, but also on an industrial point of view in terms to uh, produce uh, green energy. 
Um, so here in the slides, uh, you can see how uh, how Novartis uses the Siemens uh, data uh, coming from Copernicus, um, and uh, and it's a, a detail of, of about uh, so we, uh, what we use uh, for the north well shape. So we use altimetry uh, data uh, coming uh, for we use it for our regional and high resolution um, models. So depending on the area of interest, we use, we use it either for assimilation of our model or uh, for validation purposes. Mm, this comes from uh, Mercator and the Copernicus Parent Services. And as you can see also uh, from this picture, uh, right, uh, right uh, head uh, picture, uh, we use uh, three different satellites, uh, JSON 1, 2, and Sarah Altica uh, for validate our tidal model. Um, also, we use uh, in-situ uh, network measurement uh, coming from uh, Tides Gauge. Uh, it's on the um, below uh, pictures. Uh, so in uh, North Sea, uh, North West Shelf, uh, and also Atlantic Sea. So this one also for uh, validate and, and uh, for validation purpose of our uh, tidal model. Um, and of course, um, to make a tidal model and tidal prediction system, uh, we need some good bathymetry uh, data. So in this case, uh, we use another program, which is EdmondNet, uh, a new plan program. Um, so what we provide uh, through Tidy, uh, Tidy services. So it's based on, on the tidal prediction uh, that have been uh, computed for one year and, uh, and uh, so for more than a year, sorry, uh, to get an average uh, yearly condition and tidal are used, uh, tidal conditions are, that are used are extract from our in-house tidal prediction system called TIPS. So we provide some uh, different indi indicators like maximum current speed, percentage of, uh, of uh, an occurrence uh, speed uh, above a different threshold, 1.5 meters per second and 3 meters per second, and also average per run density. So this, um, this is available anywhere in the world at location with water depths uh, below 100 meters. Uh, so we could have been computed uh, for the whole, for the whole uh, ocean seas, let's say, uh, but uh, on, based on an literal purpose, uh, tidal, uh, tidal turbines are not, let's say, now uh, planned to be installed uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, deep water depths. So we we just uh, focus on, on uh, let's say, uh, coastal uh, coastal region with motor depths less below that than 100 meter. Model resolution is is uh, is based on irregular grid. So, depending on the on the position uh, from the coastal, it can be from one, uh, 80 kilometers to seven kilometers. Um, again, as it was uh, um, a service dedicated to industrial uh, company. Uh, we, we launched also uh, um, a web platform uh, to propose and, and uh, yeah, to propose this kind of, of, of services uh, on an easy way uh, and access. Uh, again, it was uh, without a lot of talk with with the industrial company that uh, that um, show that there, there was a need uh, for this kind of data and uh, a need also to have uh, easy access to this data. So uh, two years ago, we launched an uh, innovation platform. Um, so I encourage you to, to free register on this platform. You can create an account. And uh, on top of uh, tidy uh, prediction, tips prediction as well, so tidal prediction, um, you can have a lot of uh, much more uh, parameters, um, wind, wave, uh, uh, current, uh, ice, extreme events. So you can see on the, on the screen that uh, you have a, a lot of, of different uh, parameters to so, uh, animated this map, this map sorry. Um, you can also have uh, access to um, in-cast and, uh, and forecast data. So regarding tips, um, you can request uh, tidal uh, data uh, when for tips, tidal, so tidal elevation, uh, it's not limited to 100 meters of water depth. It's, it's really a uh, uh, available uh, anywhere in the world. Um, at sea. <laughs> uh, you can see on the on the on the video map uh, that uh, kind of map with elevation. So you can request 
uh, elevations um, uh, to anywhere and uh, with uh, with uh, no limit in, in terms of time scale. You can you can if you want to plan some operation or you want to have some data in the for the coming years, you can uh, easily uh, download download, download this, uh, this data. Uh, so we also have developed some high uh, resolution uh, specific models for uh, locations that are uh, of major interest in terms of styles. So uh, basically uh, around, uh, around UK, uh, Celtic Sea, Baltic Sea, uh, and also um, in, in, uh, in Mediterranean Sea. Uh, which is quite strange, but <laughs> we'll talk about it a bit later. Um, in terms of tidal elevation, uh, you, you can also uh, order, uh, you can get the data, uh, current roses with main direction and velocities, that and elevation of high and low waters and lowest astronomical uh, tide level. And concerning tidy, so um, based on, on the the, the parameters that I, I talk about, maximum velocity, power density, um, occurrence, speed occurrence. Uh, in the same way, you can, you can request these parameters from the, from the web platform uh, to, to, to get uh, it as a easy access. Um, last slide is, is, is about how to show you um, tidal potential, I mean, two, two different maps, uh, but tidal potential on, on the left, uh, and uh, usage that has been done of our platform tips uh, on the, on the, at the same location. So you can see that uh, there was plenty of, of requests uh, at, the, at the location where uh, the potential are the, are the maximum one. Uh, so basically uh, between UK and France and around, around the UK waters, uh, but also um, uh, coast of Portugal. But we can see also that there was some request in, in Mediterranean Sea, so can be a bit uh, bit strange. Um, uh, but uh, it was a really good uh, good um, let's say uh, indicators for for us that we can notice that uh, some user some use of our, our tips data was not only focused on uh, renewable marine energy and, and tidal energy, but also. Uh, discussing with 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 company um, on on other on their, uh, uh, activities. So, for example, uh, they were uh, like shipping company or or, or marine uh, marine uh, construction company that were interested in in knowing in advance what will be the tides uh, and and therefore what will be the water level uh, for them to perform uh, specific activities. Uh, dredging or, or some something other, or for uh, big uh, big ships to be able to to know that uh, what would be the water level and if they have to some trouble to to go some one place to another or to ex to to exit uh, a port for example. Um, so on the on the top of the data itself, what is interesting for our client is the fact that the data is is clickable uh, and downloadable uh, easily uh, through the platform. Uh, of course, final clients have access to all the quality information about the data since we have uh, we are providing full transparency to say how we use uh, CMEMS data and free data and we provide validation reports. So we show in which zone we are very good uh, and for other zones we are, uh, let's say, uh, there is a potential for improvement um so we can improve this with new technology so either we we, we develop uh, a high resolution model or fine scale model on, on this specific zone or uh, as bathymetry is a, is a major has a major impact on on, on also tidal model uh, we can also develop some specific solution to improve bathymetry uh, for example on on, uh, on shallow water uh, near, near the coast um, so initially dedicated to the hydroelectric electric industry, uh, this tool is, uh, is intended to be scalable and aim also to become a uh, reference in the marine renewable industry. Uh, but uh, we, we show, I mean, we, we saw that um, specific company can have a, 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 um, a pure need of tidal, uh, uh, tidal uh, information, but uh, we also uh, now provide full meteorological studies, including tidal prediction, uh, to uh, other clients, uh, especially in the wind uh, offshore um, 
for with offshore developers because uh, also this, this information is quite important for them in order to 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 design and assess uh, the, the capacity of of a wind farm um so I think, yep i'm done i did quite short but thank you very much for your attention and i'm i'm uh, i'm here to to answer your question please Nice presentation, Leopold. Thank you very much. Very clear, very impressive. Uh, um, so, any question in the in the Zoom? No. And in the room? No question. Oh. So, um, yeah, yes. Maybe Leopold. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, do, do you have a, an idea about uh, the potential um, members of customers of, of your services and how they will, uh, uh, if they are satisfied by what you have proposed uh, for, for, uh, for their personal use of uh, the activity? Um, our, our, our uh, number of customers is still uh, is still uh, is still progressing. Uh, first, we, we target uh, really uh, uh, tidal energy developers, but um, um, this is still a, um, um, uh, let's say a, a field into improvement. I would say um, there is some uh, pilot, uh, some uh, uh, concept design, but not so not so far uh, industrial project about uh, tidal energy. Um, so there is a lot of startup using our, 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 our data uh, because they want to, to, to check their concept design against, against uh, um, available uh, resources, uh, potential of resources, and, and see also where it could be interesting for them to, to, uh, to install a, a, a full-scale pilot. Um, also, uh, we saw that this data can be um, uh, interesting, uh, as I said, for other uh, other um, uh, industrial sector like like shipping, like uh, marine construction, like um, uh, other uh, renewable activities like uh, wind farm, for example, which is uh, uh, much more uh, into development right now. Uh, but they won't need uh, this data uh, alone. Uh, they would need this data uh, in conjunction with, uh, in addition with, uh, with also uh, uh, wind, uh, current, wave statistics. So we 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 have this tool uh, to provide this data, this data on a standalone basis, but also we provide this data um, in, as I say, in, in addition to uh, other data, uh, metrosion data for for. Um, it's for uh, other for other clients than than pure uh, tidal energy uh, developers. Thank you. Any other comments? Question? No. So thank you very much, Leopold. Thank you. So this um, this ends the, the the session one and this morning. So the, can you um, unshare, stop the sharing of your screen, please? Okay, uh, I think I do edit it. Sorry? I think I, 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 uh, I stopped sharing, can you check? Oh, you still? No. Uh, oh. right, yes. yes, sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> So, no, yes, this one. Okay, so we come back at uh, two o'clock for the session two. So thank you very much for the, for the nice presentation we had. Uh, please, for people who have sent the, who have done the presentation remotely, can you send us at least a PDF version of your presentations? You can send it uh, uh, to me by email, please. Um, and uh, so we see all together in session two, please people who were attending to the session one, you are invited, of course, to uh, take part of the session two and the session three 
for this afternoon. So thank you very much. We will stop the, the recording and the, the video and the sound transmitting, and we will meet again at two o'clock. Thank you very much. La caméra est ouverte, tout le monde. Hello again. Alors, pourquoi on n'apparaît pas nous C'est ça. Yeah. So, this is time for uh, starting the session two. And uh, for the first presentation, we have the pleasure to hear from uh, Carlo Buentempo from ICMWF. So, I stop the sharing and the virtual floor is yours. You can share the screen. Open yeah. your mic and that will be great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Perfect. and you can, you can see your presentation. Fantastic, that's great. Um, we are in for um, triple yummy this afternoon because um, I'm stuck at home with COVID, so my voice is probably not the best. Um, I have someone doing uh, some restoration work in the, in the floor above me, which may provide some background noise. And, uh, and my wife is in a teleconference as well, so I hope everything goes smoothly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so if you can hear me, I'll start. You can go on. Thank you. Um, well, pleasure with, uh, to be with you, even if only uh, virtually. And uh, I will be talking to you, and thank you for the invitation. And, and I will be talking to you about the climate change service and uh, a few case studies related to energy and renewable energy in particular. So um, probably most of you are familiar with the climate change service, but um, for those of you who are not, um, this is one of the six thematic services um, in which is the Copernicus program, the Earth Observation Program of the European Union is structured. So we have the atmosphere, the, the marine, land and uh, emergency and security and the climate change service, which is the most junior of the services. In a nutshell, what we are trying to do is to um, transform petabyte of data, uh, climate data coming from observation, satellite observation, but also ground-based observation and model simulations into, into few kilobytes of information relevant to uh, the end users. Uh, and we do this through a, a unified web interface um, that we call the Climate Data Store. And you can reach it at the URL that you see on the top. At the moment, we have roughly 135,000 users re registered on the Climate Data Store, uh, number going up roughly around 3,000 uh, user per month. And to this user, we deliver typically some 80 terabyte of, of uh, climate data per day. So this is um, all um, a bit abstract. I, I, I will have a few top level slides like this at the beginning, and then I will dive a bit deeper into some of the case studies. So in terms of the portfolio, um, maybe you're familiar with this sort of visualization of the climate stripes. You see the warming of the of the climate system uh, presented as redding of this uh, of these uh, um, bars. This is inspired by the work of of Ed Hawkins. So it's just a, a way of presenting the climate of the past, the present, and the future. And the spectrum of product the climate change service provide covers the entire range. So it goes from observations these being in situ and, and remote sensing observation. It covers reanalysis that account for the majority of our user and will represent one of the key elements that we'll discuss about, but also provide access to seasonal predictions and climate projections, uh, global and regional climate projections. And to use the word of an engineer um, working on the uh, wind energy area that joined a Twitter live, which is one of these um, way of doing podcast um, on Twitter. And by the way, we have another one of those on Friday, just on energy. But this guy um, intervened just to say thank you because what he felt being a compelling proposition um, of C3S was the fact of having all these different sources of, of, of data 
joined together. So he was aware of the fact that uh, climate projection existed, but he, he struggled to, to find an easy way to deal with those and certainly didn't find a way where those were available alongside observation, reanalysis and seasonal predictions. So there is value in merging all, to, all together. Very rapidly, going one step further, in terms of observation, we use the concept of the global, the global climate observing system, the, the concept of essential climate variable as a key um, uh, way of structuring our proposition. So these are 54 variables defined by the uh, global climate observing system and considered essential in describe, describing the climate system. And those you see in circle, either in red or in yellow, are um, the variables for which we provide an observational climate data record. Uh, the length of the record depends on the variable, but it's typically um, at, at, as a minimum uh, 15 years or more, and in many cases is more than, than 30 years. So that's, that's one element. The second element I was uh, mentioning also in my introduction are the reanalysis, um, the most um, known of which are the global reanalysis era five. And these, you can see those, and probably most of you you are familiar with the concept, but you can imagine those as being um, a rerun of the weather prediction model. So that's what ECNWF uh, is good at, running weather predictions globally. And as there is a rerun of the weather prediction model over the entire historical period up until uh, recently, up until a few days ago, using all the available observation, even that observation that wasn't available when the forecast was made at that time, because it arrived too late, and, and also taking advantage of all the development in the technology, in the data simulation technology, in the modeling technology that has occurred since. So just a, as a snapshot, at the bottom you see um, this stripe, which is a, you can imagine as a time height um, plot um, of the global mean temperature anomalies. And you see the warming of the troposphere, the cooling of the stratosphere, and many, many other features that I don't have time to get into. Um, one step farther, the seasonal predictions. These are the seasonal predictions produced by the global producing centers in Europe, as well as contribution from uh, the US, from Canada, from Japan, uh, and in the future also uh, from Australia. And both the numerical output um, for the forecast and the hindcast and the graphical output are freely available um, and openly available for anyone to use. And this is true for all the product we have on the catalog. Um, Finally, and then I, I, I promise I go into something more, um, uh, more related to the, the topic of the workshop. Finally, we have the climate projections. These are the climate projections coming from uh, the CIMIT, so the global projections, but also the regional projections coming from the Cordex, uh, Eurocordex in Europe and MET Cordex, but also all the other Cordex domain covering the world. Okay, I was a bit fast. I, I went through the entire portfolio, but just to give you an idea of the breadth of, of what we do. So um, to get a bit more specific, I want to, to bring an example. And rather than focusing on the example we funded ourselves, um, I, I think it's nicer to see the impact we are having outside uh, C3S uh, in the broader society. So this uh, is uh, Vortex, it's a company based in, in Spain and they are specialized in, in services for the uh, wind energy uh, industry. And they have been responsible for uh, the development or the downscaling of the global uh, wind atlas. And they did uh, this um, relatively simple and possibly uh, a big of back of the envelope um, calculation of the impact that the reanalysis had on their business. So basically they looked at the uh, cost of energy and uh, the, the install capacity. And they try to translate what a variation in the error in the annual energy production uh, would mean in terms of money, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of, of funding. And then if you uh, consider how many uh, or the level of installation per year, um, then you can sum up into something that is in the order of 100 millions for just 1% variation in the annual energy uh, production error. Um, and what they claimed, and I, I haven't had um, any way of double checking that, but that's their calculation, is that um, the added value provided by ERAFI with respect to other reanalysis they were using before um, account for something in the order of 3% uh, of the um, error in the annual energy production for a typical 
I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the calculation is clearly more complicated, but it's a top of um, back of the envelope calculation. That's the value. So the point I'm making here is that um, the investment Copernicus has made in, into this infrastructure, into services, is having an impact downstream of us for companies working in the renewable sector, and this impact is um, is propagating through society. Um, clearly, it's not just about what's happening. I mean, we are very keen to see this example, and, and we are keen to see more of those. But we have also invested in developing some example ourselves. These are um, uh, uh, and one uh, was few of the output of uh, the operational energy contract that we had both in the Copernicus one, so the phase of, of the program that finished um, last summer and is now uh, starting also in Copernicus two, which will bring us to 2027. <coughs> and this is really developing tailor um, uh, interfaces and, and data set for the energy uh, energy sector spanning all ranges so uh, from reanalysis to climate prediction so seasonal prediction and climate projections and we are wor working very closely um, and there will be more work actually coming um, in the next uh, in the next phase um, with pan-european entities on energy such as uh, ENSOE for instance the European network of transmission system operator for electricity so while this was a, a bit of a push on our side this is then having impact on uh, once more on the society. Um, but I, I tend to trust more the evidence that do not come directly from us, but come downstream of us. So um, this is another example. This is uh, IRENA, is the International Renewable Energy Agency based in Bonn. Um, and we recently uh, had a meeting with them to understand a bit better uh, what they were doing also, because now we are also based in Bonn, so they are our neighbors. And, and they presented some of the work they have done and we were very interested in learning from them. So this is a um, um, start from an assessment of the gap in, uh, in, the, in the energy production for the African country on, uh, on the corridor of uh, a corridor on, uh, um, clean energy corridor, they call it, uh, standing basically from uh, northeastern to south, uh, southern Africa. And, uh, and you see clearly that from the 2030s onward, there, there is a gap and they try to, to do their best in, uh, in, filling, in filling this gap um, with renewable energy. So in order to meet um, this challenge, then they went into um, and, and made some calculation um, using all the data they could get uh, hold of. Um, and this is what they came up uh, with. So these are areas in, in green for wind and in, in brown for, for solar PV uh, that are the most efficient in terms of energy production at the country level, uh, considering not only the, the climate, but also the cost of uh, additional infrastructure in terms of uh, distribution uh, network, in terms of new roads and the like. Um, and I, I, I'm, these are their slides. I'm not an expert on, on the work they have done. Uh, the point, uh, a bit for a bit similar to what I was saying before for Vortex, the, one the point I want to make is that once more, the, the input to, to their calculation, to their analysis, comes from, in this case, once more, the uh, reanalysis coming from, from C3S. Actually, in this case, comes twice because they, they use both the Global Wind Atlas, which is itself based on, on the reanalysis. But they also use the hourly data from ERA 5 so that they can build a, a high resolution uh, profile for, for a capacity factor for both uh, uh, PV and, and wind. So these are uh, some example of the diurnal cycle and, and the seasonal cycle for some location in Eastern Africa. And there is the reference underneath if you want to, to know more about what they've done. Um, as I said, the point wasn't so much um, to present their, their work, which is very interesting and, and very good, but more to uh, um, uh, underline the multiplicative eff effect of the investment that has been made uh, at the C3S level. Um, I just want to close with another example. And again, it's an example a bit more uh, close to home. One of our most high profile uh, output every year is the release of the European State of the Climate Report that had typically happened in April. Um, and this year um, was, um, despite not being a record breaking year for temperature, was uh, one of the most successful in terms of, uh, of outreach and, and, um, and presence on, on, on the media. So it was, it was very successful. So some of the, of the elements were the Mediterranean heat wave, the flooding in Germany and Belgium and, um, 
and a few others. But one point that was quite interesting was that um, uh, we decided to look also at an event that is, is a climate event, but is a climate event that has an impact on the energy sector. And it was uh, this um, wind drought that has affected um, a, a good part of the central and, and northwestern um, countries in Europe. So this was um, um, one of um, the, the findings. So what you see on, on the left is the 100 meter wind speed anomalies in, in terms of annual mean. It's not just, uh, it's not just uh, the wind drought in Central and, and Northwestern Europe, but it's also actually an ex uh, uh, more wind than, than average in, in, uh, in Southern Europe. So this, I, I think, calls for a better understanding and for a continuous monitoring, better understanding of the viability of the, of the renewable resources and a better monitoring of the same. Um, this is the same kind of plot, but in this case, using the ranking, so where you see the Top, you know, the dark blue. These are the lowest wind speed on, on record on the 43-year record of um, era five, and what you see in the dark red are the top uh, of the record. So you, you had, depending on the region you look at, both the worst and and, and the best year in terms of of um, uh, wind speed. I mean, clearly the, the the situation is more complicated in the sense that it's not just the, the annual mean speed that matters; it's really the capacity factor, and so variability in itself is important. But it was a step in, in the right direction, in my opinion, to, to provide this overview and to care also for, for these, um, these uh, uh, energy um, relevant variable. And this is actually the, uh, the variation in the capacity factor. So the anomaly in the capacity factor uh, for both onshore and offshore um, for uh, the European, European countries. Um, just uh, that is my last slide and then I wrap up um, just to uh, mention a few things of what is in the pipeline. Um, well, certainly uh, the biggest thing in, for us is the development of the next uh, generation of analysis, era six. So this um, is expected to start production in January 2024. So we are roughly a, a year and a half away. Um, it will be a higher resolution than it is now. So era five is roughly 30 kilometers at the moment and will probably go at 18, if not better. We'll still be hourly output and still be near real time. It will be um, a couple of analysis, coupled with the ocean, or at least with the upper ocean. Um, and, uh, and there will be more uh, output tailored to the energy modeling community, which means that actually we're very keen to, to hear from the energy practitioners on what uh, people want to, to see in these reanalysis, because this is the right time for us to, to learn and react. Uh, it's not just about reanalysis, it's also seasonal prediction, it's also about uh, new observation, and, um, and we are working uh, on, on these elements. So these are some of the points that actually were mentioned in other conversation, in other discussion with, uh, with the energy sector. So um, really, this is not um, a technology push, it's a user-driven program. And so we are very keen to hear from you and, and respond to your need uh, the best we can. So if you have a um, comment or suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. And thanks for the effort. I, we hear your voice and it was not so easy, I think. So thank you very much. Is there any <coughs> question on Zoom? Thank you. Or in the room? Yeah. No. Okay. Yes, actually, I have one, please. So you, you provide with very interesting information about anomalies in wind. You have the same is uh, in uh, solar irradiance. Is there some uh, results that we, you, you can share about uh, the fuel of what? the PV uh, of the PV? Um, yes, we. I mean, clearly, the analysis. One of the of the key element of the analysis is that they they provide um, a three D or four D characterization of the climate system. So uh, it's not just the wind or, or temperature; are all the variables, including uh, radiation. So um, we uh, typically provide in the state of the climate report, which is the, the publication I was mentioning, we provide information about sunshine hour, and this is coming from um, observation and coming from the uh, humid sat, uh, uh, climate stuff, um, uh, rather than providing ir irradiance. But um, uh, again, if there is a clear uh, 
interest from, from the industry in having a different variable that can be accommodated. Um, my understanding, and maybe I'm, um, I mean, I don't know, so I, I want to, to, to learn from you, uh, but my understanding in, in the PV area is that what really, um, the, the, most of the, of the demand at present is really for short-term forecast, um, in, in, because this dominates the variability in the short term, and this is something that we are providing not as a C3S, but more as a, as a um, uh, product of CAMS, uh, the atmospheric monitoring, um, monitoring uh, service that ECNWF is also running. So um, there, there is information there, but if there is an interest for um, a reanalysis of, of these quantities, uh, retrospective analysis uh, is certainly something we, we, can, we can do. So more than happy to. Yeah, definitely there is a need of interannual variability uh, over, over, over the long term because uh, the different sources we have for doing the pre feasibility studies for the PV farms, for example, is to have the historical data set to set to, to see what would be the P90 values, for example, you know, the, the same that we have in the wind energy uh, for the for solar, solar radiation. And then you, you're right, we need short term forecasting, but also we need this view of what will be in the 10 or 20 or 30 years ahead with respect to climate change for the solar radiation. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. That, that's really interesting. So um, I guess the low hanging fruit there, but if you can talk about sorry, low hanging fruit is the, is the reanalysis because there is, is just a matter uh, of, I mean, most of the, of the information is already there. It's almost a matter of, of formatting it and presenting it in the appropriate way. When you look at climate projections, it becomes more complicated. Not um, the, the information exists and actually in, in the demonstrator, I was mentioning some of this projection already exists, uh, but in terms of projection for PV, um, there is um, an uncertainty related to the response of the climate system to, to, to the changes. So the changes in cloudiness and the change in aerosol loading are um, somehow more uncertain than other variables, and these may have, a, may have an impact. Um, so the information um, exists, and I can point you to some of this, uh, of this, uh, of this information, um, but it's important to also um, be fully aware of, of the caveat and, and the uncertainty related to those. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We have a second question. Um, Rodrigo. Just, yeah, just look up. So, I have one comment and very quick comment and one question. Uh, so Philip was here discussing about the year to year variability and I was checking because I had an idea that PVGIS gives some output regarding that from the European Commission. And I, I noticed that they have just one metric, which is year to year variability. So it's one number and maybe it's better than knowing nothing, but uh, I believe that um, with all the reanalysis you guys have, you can do way more robust stuff. And my question was that your last slide was on, it seemed to be on future steps, but mostly from a user perspective. And what I'm, I'm interested to know is if there's any, uh, uh, near future developments that we could expect, because I remember clearly that when there was a transition from uh, era five to era five land, for me it was like wow, such mm -hmm. a difference in resolution. And so, since we have this opportunity to have you here, can we know something before before everyone else? <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, like preview. Um, well, I think the 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 big preview in in the very short term is the release of the um, regional reanalysis for Europe. So these um, five kilometers, these are um, building upon the, the example of, of uh, UERA or UERA. Um, they're, they're called SERA and should uh, become available um, within the next um, quarter. That's my expectation. Um, so this is still an investment from Copernicus One. In terms of, of the new uh, development in the next uh, few years, um, as I mentioned, the biggest development in terms of modeling is certainly the reanalysis, uh, the global reanalysis, because we'll be going from uh, 30 kilometers uh, as a minimum to 18, uh, and there is a possibility of going even higher resolution. Uh, we don't know yet because uh, 
these new VNIs will be running on the new supercomputer, the ATO supercomputer in Bologna, um, on which we haven't yet run the VNI. So we don't know how fast they, they run. And, and it's a matter of, of running the, the best resolution you, you can afford somehow. So um, we are confident we can run at 18, but there is uh, a window of opportunity of going higher, which, I mean, running the global analysis, let's say uh, 18 kilometers, means that uh, the bar is then higher for adding value at the regional level. So one of the initiatives we are um, investing on is sort of tailoring, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, dynamical downscaling. It can be um, statistical downscaling, post-processing, it can be bias adjustment of some sort of these um, global reanalysis uh, to, to have better information at the, at the local level. Um, other things that are happening is that, um, so previews, um, um, we have, I think tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, we should kick off uh, a new uh, a new contract um, to give an operational uh, life to the IPCC Atlas. So, if you're familiar with the IPCC, uh, the Atlas um, were one of the big novelty of the sixth assessment report. Uh, this interactive interface to the data that allows you to to see the signal, select models, and so on. But because of the IPCC um, process, these need to be frozen. So uh, once they have been generated, they cannot be updated. So now we are working with the University of Cantabria in Spain, who has led on the development of this uh, IPCC Atlas to operationalize the Atlas and take full advantage of the, uh, of the resources of the Climate Data Store to ensure that they are not frozen, but actually are updated regularly. So it will be uh, in our uh, ambition, our ambition is to, to have a, an easier interface to projection and a more direct connection between projection and for instance, reanalysis or gridded observation. Something that we are also supporting through new functionalities uh, uh, on uh, ESGF node for climate projections. So where is now easier than it was before, for instance, to subset or, or uh, process uh, cleverly, so to speak, the data on download. So without doing uh, later, you, you just download a smaller set because you have uh, a WPS functionalities there. So these are just a bunch of, of the novelties. There are many others. <laughs> um, happy to discuss with you if you drop me an email or, or, or get in contact if you want more details. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, one more question. Uh, it's, it's more a remark than a question. Uh, you said there's only demand for short-term forecasts uh, for uh, solar energy. I think that's not true. There is, if it would be possible to have a longer time period uh, <laughs> uh, forecast, for, uh, PV system operators would, would uh, jump on the opportunity uh, if they could predict a month ahead uh, what <laughs> produce at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah. At the horizon, it's just no meaningful accuracy anymore. Uh, but and, uh, a second to remark to that is that uh, I think this horizon can expand with uh, now that storage is becoming cheaper. Because uh, if you have no storage, you want to, you need exactly, um, you can have no phase errors. You really need to know the cloud passes at 12 o'clock. Uh, but if you have cheap storage, then you can say, okay, I can store several hours or several days. And then I only need to know somewhere during the day there's some clouds, and uh, then you can also further expand this horizon. So I don't think this. Um, so I think this demand will expand during during technological uh, development. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, sorry. I. I yeah. I misrepresented um, the point of view of the industry. Clearly, it would be not just for or uh, solar or, or wind, but for any sector, it would be fantastic to have uh, a monthly or yearly forecast uh, at hourly resolution with some skill. We know it's impossible. Nevertheless, um, I think there are things that are possible and on, on which we are getting better at. Um, and, and, you know, we, we are not necessarily that good in, in, in predicting the high resolution, but we are getting all right in, in, in getting the, the anomalies. And for some, some even seasonal anomalies. So, and for some quantities, even in Europe, that is not the best place where to look at a, a seasonal predictions. Um, for for the summer season of the Mediterranean, on temperature, there is skill, um, and and that can be harvested to some to some extent, um, and and similar for other variables. So, 
if you uh, and the, and this comment you are making about the storage uh, in a sense is a plus because if you are not so interested in the high resolution but are more interested in in the average uh, cloudiness over a, a period over a larger region then uh, i think there, there are information that can be extracted that can be of relevance thank you very much uh, carlo and thanks for the long discussion it was really interesting i think uh, uh, the people appreciate uh, your efforts for that thanks a lot thank you pleasure uh, so we now go to the presentation from uh, eric monjou so Eric, uh, if you wish to turn on your camera and share your screen, the floor is yours. Yes, I try if you can hear me. We hear you, for sure. Camera is not running for the moment. Okay. Presentation is coming normally. Have it. Let me know if I need to swap the, the screen or if no, I'm perfect. not. Perfect. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Then. Uh, the presentation is a little bit of a different nature than uh, of what we have seen uh, until now. I'm going more to focus on the Copernicus and Destiny uh, ecosystem and trying to answer the objective of the workshop that were highlighted, let's say, in the last two bullets about uh, giving you an overview of what is coming on the ESA side for the Copernicus offer and looking forward with uh, Destiny. Then, uh, like we have just seen, a few numbers to introduce the, the subject, Copernicus, uh, 200,000 uh, satellite orbits, uh, 50 million products published, 400 petabytes of data downloaded by users. This is uh, quite a lot and with half a million users. But this is not the point of this slide, as you have probably understood with the ice bear is to say that all this is uh, is done is just the tip of the iceberg. The behind all that, you have a, a lot of operation from the data acquisition to the quality. And why this is relevant for today is because we realize the uh, starting in uh, 2014 and uh, in 2018, that the, the satellite that were successfully in operation were leading to a situation where we have an increasing trend sorry, in data volume. We have the user uptake that was such that uh, we were going to hit a wall. That's the system was not, let's say it was far beyond original expectation. We had system that have been developed in, I would say the old way, we completely in, uh, independently of the, the user, the user access and creating some interdependencies. Because no launch was foreseen in the, in the period 19 to 22, I think we thought it was the right time to think about the system and to change the architecture and to upgrade this infrastructure. And that's what, what, what we have done in the last uh, three years. And starting from the first point that is in general not very popular with, uh, with users is that operational resources are not infinite. We have to manage operational resources and this is what we are doing. I think this is our task to maintain, a strat to put in place a strategic management of the operation in order that we support the long-term sustainability of the present and future operation. And I think this is, uh, this is a must to maximize the operational performances. I think we want to get the, the best out of the resources that are uh, allocated to the project. And as well to create trust with the operation. And uh, yeah, I say maximize the operational transparency because the way we are consuming resources has to be transparent and enhance the user experience, which is always, at the end, if we are doing all that, is to make sure that the user can benefit from the data. Therefore, in the last three years, operations have, have been drastically transformed and now are based on, uh, let's say, complete uh, cloud infrastructure. Everything has been moved and we went out of uh, old system design with, uh, again, dedicated infrastructure to something that is much more flexible and, uh, and open. We have reinforced a lot the industrial uh, service approach. 
We are basing all our deliveries on services with service level agreement with industry. And we have increased therefore the competitiveness of operation service provision. We have reopened to competition all services. If we look at that, then uh, two years after what has been uh, achieved is really a cost decrease. Uh, according to the way you're looking at it, you can go between 20 to 40% of uh, cost, uh, cost decrease. We are reducing the time to integrate new services. And I think this is important for the end user. In the past, a new station could be more than one year to integrate a new station. A new archive could be equivalent. Now we are capable of doing this in three months and to move data from one place to another to ensure redundancy in three months. And by favoring the service approach, we, have, we are creating as well an incentive for the for industry to deliver good quality of service. This has opened the path for the creation of a Copernicus and Destiny data space with all Sentinel and Destiny data at your fingertips. That's This is important. And again, why all that is relevant to the discussion today is the fact that we are reducing the gap between the ESA operation and the user operation. User, in the past, we were doing operation again on dedicated system, while to the end users were doing their operation on their side. Nowadays, with the new architecture and the new, and the new system, we can operate, let's say, closely to the user. We are, we are operating in the same condition that the user would operate if they are using our, our platform. Now, just an highlight on transparencies. Uh, we want to open a service, and this is going to be open in summer 22, this year, to show, to, to provide a complete transparency to the status of our operation, from satellite downlink to data access. You will have operational service dashboard. Everything will be uh, available to you. Like this, you can monitor uh, in real time the quality of our operation. And if you plug our operation into an operational chain on your side, on the user side, sorry, uh, then you can plug immediately the information coming from the operation. You would detect immediately that there is an issue with a satellite or something that is not going well in the data access. And I think this was requested by many, many services in the past. And the second aspect I want to, to highlight is the fact that we are doing benchmarking of our own service. We are measuring the quality of service from a user point of view to verify the, this quality of service, not from inside, from the report from the industrial team, but from the user point of view and measure the quality. And we can compare this as well with, I'm not showing a result here, but we can compare this as well with, uh, let's say, big, large uh, services that are existing in the world. Now, Going a little bit on the timeline, what we have done for years in Copernicus, we have operated the Copernicus uh, Open Access Hub, where products were available from Sentinel 4, Sentinel 1, 2, 3, and 5P. We have, uh, with the numbers that have already highlighted, we have, with the Commission, then uh, created uh, the four DIAS initiative, plus the one of WIKEO that was run by UMEDSAT. And now what, we're, what we have done is that we have reopened to competition the data access. And we are in the evaluation right now, I and mean, I cannot debrief on the outcome, but there will be a, one single service for the Copernicus data access that is regrouping uh, the functionalities of the data access and of the DIAS. And one of the comments we received about uh, difficulty for the user to onboard was the was the time perspective. And here the service is today with the European Commission, we have decided to put it on six years plus option on four. Same time, we are preparing for the Destiny data space. And this is for me the time to, do, to, to go a little bit on Destiny. This is an initiative from the European Commission uh aiming at developing accurate uh, digital model of the earth and uh, to to support the monitoring and to unlock the potential of digital modeling i think i'm sure you can find a lot of references about that but destiny is about modeling 
what the initiative is implemented uh, between ECMWF, ISA, and UMEDSAT. And we have separated the, the activity in three main areas with uh, according to core competencies and uh, the way we wanted to uh, interact between, uh, between us. Then uh, ECMWF is in charge of the digital twin engine and the first large digital twins for climate, for uh, extreme events. The UMEDSAT is in charge of the data lake, referencing the data, giving access to the digital twin. Sorry, I, <coughs> pardon. Um, referencing the data that are needed, the data that could be used by, that could be needed by the users, and uh, offering access to the large volume of uh, digital twin uh, simulation uh, generated by ECMWF. And ISA is in charge of the core service platform. Which is the entry point for the for the user to the system, and the core platform is the place where you can explore and analyze the destiny data, develop and exercise models and simulation, build, develop, deploy, and operate new services, as well as publish and share uh, results. I'm going quickly there because I thought this is this is not the place to go in the in the architecture, but just to highlight on the platform, then we would have several services, the core services for the platform management, user registration, users and data management services for the access to the data lake, for example, to generic access to any type of data. We just heard about ERA5, for example, the, this type of data, or uh, Eurostat data that could be uh, needed for the users for their model, for their modeling activity. Earth Twin and Data Application Services, how to do a model with, uh, if you like to work on the, um, to create your own model, uh, to, you don't need to output all the data, meaning we want to offer support there to the users. And collaborative services to make sure that this is a platform where users can share the results uh, and if they like their model uh, between uh, different teams. Highlighting some of these services, this is the slide just to give you the, the idea that we will not build one big framework trying to answer all the potential need for any type of activity based on destiny data or Copernicus data. The, the platform will be a place where we will have services that will communicate between them and that will create the, the that will reinforce this idea of ecosystem <coughs> really sorry for that um, then we have to going back to copernicus the copernicus data space ecosystem uh, we uh, the, the, the new one will come with streamlined data access data discovery on demand production traceability services classical thing. But in addition, we have the destiny ecosystem that we, that is going to be built and they have an interface together. They are, let's say, there will be some overlap between services. We, we don't want to redevelop visualization. There will be a lot of visualization, uh, let's say, application available. There will be some on the Copernicus data, data space. We don't want to redevelop what exists already. We want to make use of it. For that, we will make sure that we are operating with a unified user management and a type of federation that will allow us as well to connect to other ecosystem. And I think this is important to mention that this is done with DigiConnect, that is, and we will take benefit of all this initiative from DigiConnect as well on the data space, European data space. And before I'm getting the question, we will make sure that we are not duplicating again, the, not only the services, but as well the data. And this is for me another transition to the data offer for the Copernicus. In future, you will always have full and free access, and this is not changing. The, the policy, the data policy is still the same, but the data offer will change. We we'll have immediate online access to all Sentinel user level data over Europe. Meaning it's uh, no longer, let's say, the need to uh, asynchronous access for product that are in archive or, and so on and so forth. Everything will be online. And the same for the worldwide, it would be at least one year online. 
And this is the minimum, meaning according to the offers that we will receive, we will uh, probably get more, but again, I cannot debrief today. Then the Copernicus contributing mission, that's our mission, uh, different from the Sentinel where we are procuring data on behalf of the Copernicus services, we will reunify the two systems uh, to get access to this data. And this data, especially the one that are open, uh, open and free, uh, will be uh, will be available from the same portal, and as well additional data sets. And that we will have to wait for the for the new service to enter in operation to the brief about. But uh, the different bidders were invited to provide new uh, new data sets. A small note, because I saw that preparing for this meeting that some of you may be interested, is that on the Sentinel-2 data, we are reprocessing all the Sentinel-2 data. And uh, here I put reference to the Copernicus dam at 90 meters, but there is a lot of effort to do it at, uh, let's say, at 30 meter uh, resolution. And all these data would be our plan to be available, I think, starting from uh, second half of this year. Now, another activity I like to uh, highlight is the fact that we are doing the re-engineering of all the Sentinel processor in order to do it, let's say, to be, uh, to adapt the, the processing paradigm to the cloud infrastructure and to offer to the user a much more modular uh, access to this uh, processing elements and to, to make them available to users, uh, to interested users. Being, and what we like to do is really to trigger the on-demand and change a little bit the, the paradigm and to make sure that on-demand production is becoming one of the ways to get data on the, on the user side, one of the ways to customize a workflow on the user side to, to better prepare a workflow for, for their operation. Uh, this will come with some uh, product format updates, but we will uh, make sure that we distribute in advance and we, uh, we provide uh, data in advance. We will as well provide some backward compatibility or software to, to make sure that ongoing uh, <coughs> operational chain are not impacted. Now, I go very quickly, I'm checking the time. Uh, I took note this morning of one of the objectives, if I understood well from eShape, that was really to demonstrate the benefit as well of uh, what we are doing. We have the same process, we have to demonstrate, being Copernicus or being um, Destiny, to uh, uh, demonstrate the benefits of uh, let's say the, the resources we are spending and uh, the, the effort that is being done. And there are activities that are done at the level of uh, the region, European region, for example, or even some economical studies that are being done. And I think I'm not an expert on this field, but these are activities that we like to reinforce as well in the future. And I think a clear link with V-shape can, uh, can be made. Now, the last part of my presentation, with one uh, introduction slide about the different roles that the, uh, I'm back on Destiny, where we can see that the roles can be either service provider. And here, I, I want to highlight to all of you that there will be a competition uh, starting before the end of this year. And therefore, if some of you are interested, you can be part of some of this consortium. It can be Destiny users, pure consumers of uh, Destiny services, contributor, if you want to share data or resources with the uh, Destiny user communities, or third party, if you like to move some of your service on top of the platform. And there will be in, uh, in this category, some use cases that will be uh, selected and the competition again is under preparation this year where we will select few use cases to verify the different interfaces and paradigms we are developing with the, with the platform. Now, going to the conclusion, the best way to influence the ecosystem, because we are trying to, to develop, and here again, I would like to point at what was said uh, at, uh, in, uh, this morning about co-design. We're not doing co-design, but we like to be influenced by the, by the end users and uh, by the, the project and the potential third party. 
we have our own objective. And here we are clear, we would like to support the local exploitation of uh, Copernicus and Destiny data. We like as well to support the development and uh, the, of complementary services for end users. And uh, these are the, the third party services. And these third party services, it's critical for us, it's really important shall be autonomous, meaning uh, this is uh, Copernicus uh, destiny insight type of approach, meaning we are not trying to, to dictate how the service, what should be the service, the service should simply make use of the platform, and this is uh, the service, the third party service are completely free to organize themselves, and support collaboration between eco ecosystem users. Then, uh, for bullets to say how to the best way to influence the ecosystem. First, provide feedback. We are organizing uh, yearly events, checkpoints. Uh, we will try to put in operation a version uh, of services in an early version, by the way. But this is meant to get feedback. I mean, don't hesitate to test when it is deployed and to feedback to us. Uh, we will put as well then uh, interfaces to make sure that we can collect this feedback in an efficient way. One recommendation for the different projects is that you should clarify your operational model. You should verify that if you are intend to deploy your service, that uh, what is the expectation for this service uh, now and in future? What is the expected scalability? And uh, very often we, we see groups that are coming with just a prototype phase in mind and not completely not prepared for the, the full success of the service. You have to establish as well your operation model, how the services are consuming resources, what are the resources that are being consumed by your service. And I think, again, uh, very often we see services and I had a very nice discussion recently that with uh, a project where they were just saying, I want to process everything whenever I like, whenever and as, uh, as many times I like, let's say, without any kind of restriction. And this is, this is not possible because once again, operational resources are limited. And we have to manage that. You have to verify your integration within the ecosystem and look at what exists and uh, take benefit of uh, what is existing, what is being already deployed, and verify what is the role you want to take on the platform. And uh, last point, you can really influence the, uh, the ecosystem by maximizing the benefits from the ecosystem. Your, the attitude of the service should really be, how can I better exploit the platform and if something is not there, then don't hesitate to ask. Ask for complementary local data, ask for complementary service, ask for support. And I think we're looking for operational win-win here. And this is concluding my presentation. Thank you very much, Eric. Thanks a lot for this recommendation and for this appetizer. So uh, one of the questions I have in, in mind uh, is when it starts, when we are ready to, to use it and to uh, explore uh, all the things. And do you have a first date for the launch of the platform? Or a new date? For the Copernicus new services, this is for the end of the year. We will ensure the um, say overlap with the current service, but we plan to be in operation before the end of this year. And for Destiny, it's mid of next year. We want to open the platform, as I said, with early version of some services as soon as possible. We would like to avoid a kind of uh, big event, uh, just giving the user, let's say, cutting the ruban, and, uh, uh, but rather to have uh, a smooth transition and uh, like this, collect feedback as early as possible. Okay, great. So uh, less than one year from, from now, let's say. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Any question from Zoom? I don't think uh, from the, the room. Additional one? No, it's OK. It was clear and crystal. OK, thank you very much, uh, Eric, uh, thank and you. for your presentation. So.
Our next speaker is uh, Edouard. Uh, so, uh, Edouard, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. You are, we, are, we have shifted the two presentation once forward and once backward, so you can open yours. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. So I hope you can see my presentation. You can hear me properly. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you for inviting me uh, to to give a presentation. Um, hopefully, because I, I'm I'm lately I'm giving lots of presentations about USPA because I think it was important as a, as a new agency since last year that uh, you all know uh, what is the role of the agency to foster the market uptake of uh, Copernicus. Uh, so you might have seen some of the slides uh, that that I'm presenting in different events. Uh, hopefully, I, I'm always trying to put uh, at least one or two slides new, so that uh, so that you will find it interesting, even if you have uh, seen some of my presentations lately. So uh, let me start just for those who still don't know, uh, if there is still somebody that know, don't know uh, who are uh, who is USPA. Uh, so USPA stands for EU Agency for the Space uh, Program. We are a new agency since uh, last year, so the 12th of May we made the uh, first anniversary. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's an agency that is leveraging from the previous agency dedicated to the exploitation of GNSS the, uh, for Galileo and Egnos for the GNSS program from the European Union. But now, since last year, we're also in charge of uh, other components of the EU space program. Uh, for different activities for each of them. So, uh, in any case, what we are trying to put is in the in in a uh, in the same umbrella, uh, all the components of the EU space program. So, the Earth observation with Copernicus, Galileo and Egnos, uh, for uh, GNSS, uh, for navigation systems, uh, and uh, we're also working on the new secure communication systems for uh, governmental users, which is GovSatcom. Uh, and others that are still at center negotiation with our uh, space situation awareness or SST. Uh, so this is uh, the, 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 the context that we are working now, but our main role uh, for, uh, for all the components is to foster the market uptake. Uh, for, let's say for, uh, as, you, as you have seen, for different components, uh, we have different responsibilities also for market uptake. So for example, for GovSatcom is mainly focused on governmental users. For GNSS, it's uh, it's a whole scope of the users, but for Copernicus in particular, is for uh, for other users. It's not for the core users. But in any case, I wanted to show in this slide what is the methodology or the or the approach that we're following for uh, fostering the market uptake. Uh, this is uh, this is something that we had worked in the past for GNSS uh, in order to increase the uptake of Galileo when uh, when it was first declared operational in 2016. Uh, and we are going to follow a similar methodology for the components. So first, you can see on the left what we call the market user knowledge pillar, in which we uh, it's a basic uh, start or baseline in which we have to know who are the users and how is the market that can benefit from the different uh, EU services. So for that, we have different tools like uh, market and technology monitoring, but we have uh, also the user consultation platform in which we are trying to uh, to get all the information from, from requirements, uh, from an application, from the user point of view. Then we have the one support, in which is a more, at, uh, let's say, a, a, a top-down approach, uh, looking at uh, what are the uh, possible regulations that are required, uh, looking at uh, best practices, uh, talking to the industry to see how can we, let's, let's say, more push of the, of the technology or of the services that are already existing, rather than on the left that in which we are gathering requirements and we are uh, putting that into the program to, to try to define uh, the services. And then on the, on the right, you will see the offer creation that is an important part because it's how we are giving support to the industry in order to create uh, new solutions that are using these uh, space services. So for this, we have different tools, and I, and I will uh, go through them a little bit uh, a little bit later. So uh, as I said, the focus on of USPA, and this has to be clear because there are many entities in the in the use space program, is to develop the market for non-core users, for other users, uh, or how we define the, them. Also, sometimes we call them commercial users, but it's not only commercial users, but they can be, for example, NGOs 
or some uh, charities, research or, or international organizations that are not included currently in the uh, in the core part of the of the program. Uh, and this, in any case, uh, we are bringing more the the downstream market perspective to support the downstream market, but always in collaboration with the market uptake that the entrusted entities are doing for the for the core users because uh, of course there will be uh, many actions that they have been doing till now and they will still be doing in which we have to closely coordinate so so that we don't overlap and that we are really uh, well integrated when when providing this approach to the downstream uh, sector uh, so this is one of the tools as i, as I mentioned is the uh, market and uh, technology monitoring and uh, the first outcome that uh, that we produced in which we already included Earth Observation was the uh, Earth Observation and GNSS Market Report that was published last January. Hopefully you have downloaded it, but as you will see, uh, the way that we work in uh, in, uh, in the agency in, in, in the sense of market development is structured in, in different verticals in what we call market segments. And as you can see here in the, in the red circle, uh, here I have pointed the energy and raw materials uh, segment, which in reality is it's true, it's, it's two different segments, but we have put them to, together uh, in this time. But you will find here information about the uh, latest trends, about the market forecast, uh, different uh, type of information. I'll give a glimpse of uh, what is there uh, for each of the market segments. So it's a it's a it's a tool also for investors, for uh, for innovators that uh, want to see. Uh, how is the market going? If they should put their effort in 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 this application or in another application, so it's it's a a, a preliminary tool, so so uh, so we can support some decision making in, in in types of where to where to invest. Uh, if we focused in energy, so uh, we know, of course we know now the 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 situation we uh, with energy is it's really important. Uh, the the effort that we have to put in the renewable energies, uh, as you know, uh, the Commission has put the had put the fit for 55 with some target uh, of for uh, 2030 of reaching a, a share of the energy for renewables of 40 percent. But now uh, with the new policy of Repower EU, there's a new proposal to increase that to even 45 percent. So uh, we see this there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, for investment and for creating new solutions on uh, on renewable energy, and uh, we believe that there is a lot of, of opportunity for Earth Observation and Copernicus in particular to support uh, these technologies. And as you can see on the right, we have also made a, a, an analysis of what is the share on the different type of sources for renewables uh, that are used for these uh, uh, for these solutions. So you can see that the majority is for uh, wind and uh, hydropower. Uh, but the third one is solar with a 14%. Uh, but we have uh, it's it's uh, it's important to notice that solar uh, in two in 2008 it was only accounting for a uh, for one percent. So it has been the one that has grown the most in the in the last 10-15 uh, years. But we cannot forget also other type of uh, of sources apart from these three let's say mainstream ones, uh, which are uh, other type of offshore. Uh, energy sources uh, and uh, also biofuels or biomass, uh, in which I will give now uh, some some details. Also, this information that you can see in the slide, you can find it as well in the market report. So uh, the kind of revenues that can be generated by Earth Observation data uh, in terms of uh, data, but also of added value services. Uh, and we have tried to put uh, what is the share of these revenues for different types of applications. Uh, but Earth observation applications. So uh, let's say, for example, here you can see that 52% uh, could be accounted for energy network condition monitoring. Uh, then you have uh, the second one is renewable energy assessment potential and forecast. And then you have others that, uh, in any case, you can see on the right the forecast to uh, that we have done uh, for the next 10 years. All of them are uh, are growing uh, in, in in quite good manner, but still. Uh, I, we believe that there is a lot of potential. As you can see, the, the revenue in, in 2020 was 141 million, which is not that much considering uh, uh, the global perspective. And, and 
of course you have shown that in the in the morning so i, I will not go too much into it in, into detail but what you can find in the report as well is uh, not only what earth observation in general can do but we have tried to put also what copernicus in particular can bring to each of the of the different applications in the in the energy industry for example this is a, an example for uh, for solar photovoltaic in which different products from uh, that were already presented by uh, by carlo uh, from cams from c3s uh, can support the uh, the estimation of the energy uh, for the for the selection of the optimal site but also for the for the forecasting of the uh, or prediction of the amount of energy that can be generated in the in the future similarly we have four wind farms you have also uh, mentioned that and you have seen that in the in the in the morning even if unfortunately i was not able to join but uh, i'm sure you I, I have seen the title of the presentation so for sure you discuss this so there's different types of information from copernicus uh, data and copernicus services that can can uh, can be added to uh, to to the site selection uh, for wind farms as well and for the prediction of uh, of the potential energy that can be generating so land cover information digital elevation model but also forecast on on climate variability similarly for hydropower so for hydropower you can monitor with uh, with different types of uh, of copernicus products what is the amount of water that is for example in uh, in different uh, uh, in the in the rivers in dams and that can be translated eventually into into potential energy. Uh, the the good thing, or the different thing of uh, hydropower is that it uh, compared to solar or uh, or uh, or wind is that it's more controllable. Let's say that you you when once you know the amount of water that it's there, you can uh, release it and uh, whenever you need the energy. So combined with the other uh, type of energies, it provides this kind of flexibility uh, when you need more energy, for example. So it's a it's a different type in which uh, in which Copernicus can provide this data. And for example, it's, it's interesting that you can you can, uh, for example, know the amount of snow uh, in in terms of depth or extension, and that eventually can translate into into the meltdown. So uh, amount of water that will flow down through the river and uh, and directly through the uh, hydropower stations. So all this information can can be can be added uh, to uh, the forecasting to the management of the of the different type of plants. And as I said, there uh, of course there are not only these three mainstream, but there are different types of uh, of other let's say not mainstream uh, powers. But that there we believe that there is there there, there is a lot of untapped potential. Uh, here, for example, uh, I think there was a presentation this morning about uh, wave energy, uh, but uh, similarly you can get from tides, from swells, uh, and you can use Copernicus Marine Service, uh, different products to uh, to get also esti estimations of the amount of power that you can get from the from the movement of the of the ocean or the seas. And uh, a different type of energy, which I also mentioned, is the biomass energy. So you can also uh, produce energy. Uh, with biomass or with uh, different type of uh, of uh, crops of or uh, other unutilized uh, lands uh, and materials and for that you can also use land monitoring service or the climate change service for uh, for adding information for that and monitoring what can be the uh, the amount of energy that could be generated and and this is just an example that because we are still uh, dealing with GNSS so we are looking at always uh, synergies between different space components. So when we talk, for example, about energy, so we want to look uh, what GNSS can bring and what Earth Observation or Copernicus can bring uh, here. So these are examples. For example, we can see that for the uh, for the assembly of uh, of wind turbines offshore, uh, this is a this is a solution that we have seen in research, but uh, it's still trying to to be put into production uh, to put a high accuracy GNSS in order to assembly the different type of blades blades with the uh, with a wind turbine which is very difficult in the, with the motion of the of the sea uh, it's also very useful for uh, for monitoring the uh, and and maintenance of uh, of different for example for solar power stations there are different solutions that for example have drones monitoring uh, if there is any malfunction in uh, in, in the solar panels uh, through through some thermal cameras and for that you need precise GNSS to know the location and to know which panel are you monitoring and so on and so forth. 
uh, but also you can use GNSS specifically for timing and synchronization, which is very important for the distribution of uh, and for the, the settle uh, of, of the energy and for smart grids. So for that, there is a, a specific uh, device that using GNSS that's called uh, phase measurement units. So <clears throat> uh, I have I had some examples, but I think uh, I, Novel. I think I had the presentation this morning. So, uh, but I think it was for uh, for wave power. But uh, they also have this solution for Mantua Solar. Uh, for uh, monitoring uh, the the amount of uh, solar energy that can be generated in in rooftops, um, using uh, partly Copernicus data from the atmosphere monitoring service, among others. Uh, this solution that I had here was mentioned as well by uh, by Carlos, so I will not go into detail. But just to mention that these are the kind of solutions that we are trying to support. So the creation of solutions that are eventually have the uh, the, possi the possibility or the, the, the scope to be commercially uh, viable. So not only research solutions, which are very nice, but our scope is to uh, demonstrate uh, that Copernicus can be used also for commercial solutions and generate value and generate revenues for these companies and of course benefits for the eventually for the citizens. And this is an, another example, uh, a, a company from Denmark called Wave Piston, in which they use uh, Copernicus Marine se se the service for estimating or simulating the uh, the energy potential for uh, for wave products, um, for uh, for wave power, uh, estimating which would be the best location to put the devices to generate the, the energy. So then uh, let me uh, just go now through the finding opportunities that uh, you can get with, with USPAD, which is mainly these two tools, which are Horizon Europe and, uh, and Cassini, but not only. For Horizon Europe, we have the first call that is already closed last year, uh, which uh, the main call on Copernicus together with GNSS was uh, the first one that you see for the European Green Deal, so it was quite generic. This call is closed and it's under evaluation. Uh, in any case, the process will start next year and we're looking at uh, uh, broad uh, use cases implementing uh, Genesis and Copernicus. Now we have a second call that will open in October. And here we have, uh, here you, you, you have, uh, you see that there are some calls uh, with Genesis, but others with Copernicus and some mix. So the ones with Copernicus here in particular uh, will be the one focused, uh, it's a type of action uh, PCP, preferred commercial procurement and focus for uh, public uh, entities. Uh, here using uh, either Copernicus or Galileo. Then we have another one, which is an innovation action called Copernicus Lastream Applications and the European Data Economy. And the other one that is similar, because it's also targeting uh, artificial intelligence, HPC, so also data, uh, but more uh, at a research level. So it's a research and innovation action. Uh, all these have been published in the work program and will be published, I think, in, in core of this with the full specifications of the, of the call uh, very soon. And I'm sure we'll do an innovation and uh, an info day uh, just before the, the call is opened in October. But the deadline for submissions will be probably in February or March. Then we have uh, the Cassini initiative in which uh, it, compared to Horizon, it's more targeting entrepreneurship. So the creation of solutions for uh, startups or, uh, or SMEs and support them to grow. So we have different activities like hackathons, uh, different prices. And then we have some activities in which we want to put in contact these uh, small uh, entrepreneurships, uh, small entrepreneurs uh, and, uh, and SMEs with venture capitals and uh, with different funding opportunities. So it's not only about creating the solution, but we want to also support them uh, to grow uh, and, to, and to enter the market. So these are, we have different activities that we can find, you can find in our website. And if you want more information, I can also, also send it to you offline. And finally, last but not least, I'm sure you are aware of the uh, procurement that we have just uh, launched, published, uh, I think, last month or uh, the beginning of this month, which we call Copernicus Demonstrators. It's uh, something that we could say similar to what uh, eShape is doing. Uh, but what uh, we really want to focus is in the uh, finding uh, the commercial, commercial viable products and with innovative solutions. So we're not looking at... Uh, 
solutions that already exist that that's clear that there are already products uh, existing because that uh, we don't want to repeat things that uh, it's already there and they have been already demonstrated but something that is a little bit more innovative that it's pushing a little bit the boundaries and for that we have two different lots one uh, dedicated to mobility emergency and infrastructures and a second lot for consumer and environment uh, here you have the link but i'm sure you 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 have seen it already or you can if not you can go to USPA website and you will find it easily uh, i'm not going through through the different uh, examples of uh, proof of concept that we are proposing for each of the lots you can find that in the specifications of the call but just to mention that for the second lot there is one specifically for green mining and energy in which we are looking for uh, innovative proof of concept for uh, for energy or for uh, for raw materials uh, so as I said here, what we're looking is that it's two phases. The first phase is more checking the technical feasibility of the solution. And the second phase, uh, just the most innovative use cases or the most impactful use cases will be selected for implementation. So uh, what we will look is at the implementation that is involved in the whole value chain. So from the data generation, from the uh, final user uh, exploitation of the of the data and the the incorporation of of that solution into the operational environment of the user so real uh, let's say viable solution and product in which we want to also check the commercial viability of of it so not only st stopping at the, at the research uh, level and if you want more information on the demonstrators so we'll have a we call it industry day webinar on the 6th of june you can uh, find it if you google it and you can register already uh, it's a webinar one two hours in which we we will explain the the uh, what we are looking for and also the the legal and the eligibility constraints and how to apply so you can you can make any type of question there and yeah that's that's everything from my side thank you very much for listening thank you very much Edouard. And the first question from the room. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Okay, just get closer. So as you, you last mentioned the legal aspect of uh, all this, um, let's say, USPA umbrella covering in other uh, sector, the, the Copernicus activity. I was, um, I was wondering, uh, do you have already some discussion because what you try to um, achieve is operational product, business oriented type of product based on some data coming from the Copernicus namely, and I know quite well the one from CAMS, which basically are spread between some, uh, let's say big units and as well some SMEs providing some services. So are you currently discussing about the legal aspect and the support in order to achieve this basically a uh, business oriented product that may basically be fueled by services which currently are provided under some, let's say, legal and, and let's say way of accessing that may not allow this commercial activity. Uh, no, when I'm talking about the in the that in the innovation day, they will talk about uh, legal aspects, mostly is about the eligibility and what how you should plan your proposal, how should you uh, make a proposal to be eligible and to be uh, successful. No, not, uh, it, not about sorry, that. I understood. Uh, the, the thing is that it was echoing your last legal mention, but it was more general, general towards the, uh, let's say, Copernicus, let's say, way of supporting business oriented activity. So is there some discussion in order to make sure that the service behind Copernicus may accommodate some business activity. I'm thinking, for example, to some restriction about the number of potential access to a given service. So this, this what, what we're looking for is not to generate a Copernicus service or Copernicus product, but a product that is specific for the industry. Uh, then uh, what we are asking is that this uh, final solution will be based on Copernicus data, products and services with all the limitations or the uh, benefits that it has. So uh, if you can use any open data, open services, that's perfect. If you want to use something that has some limitations, some constraints, some legal uh, constraints, I don't know, this has to be analyzed in the proposed solution. So we are not looking at, uh, at those constraints, but we're looking as to have a final solution that is 
uh, going to be viable for the end user. And with the end user, that's why we are providing these uh, areas or use cases. It has to be focused for uh, for industrial uh, use. So we're not looking at uh, establishing a, a, a new service for Copernicus or for product for Copernicus because that's not our scope. It's somebody that is going to create, I don't know if I, if I could say, a platform for, uh, from, for uh, farmers to, uh, to, uh, to get their, uh, I don't know, the, their crops better and uh, more efficient. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, getting different types of products from different types of, uh, of Copernicus services. Or, and, and of course, it's not in, only limited to that. You can also use different types of sensors, drones, uh, in situ data. Uh, it's, what it has to be clear is the value added of Copernicus data products and services within the solution. But it's not the only the only technology that you can apply, obviously. I don't know if it was clear and it, if I answered the, the question. Thank you, uh, Yunel. Another question from the room? So a, a small one from my side. Uh, when we are looking to uh, our collaboration with uh, SMEs, uh, sometimes we have um, some uh, demand on how to, to find some funds to, uh, to develop a product. I think you, you already present in the Cassini activities uh, one tracks for that, which is uh, the one on the left, on the upper left. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, fully the upper did. left is the hackathons. Then we have the prices. The prices. Uh, with the okay. example that you can see if you look at the My Use Space competition, which is ongoing, and there will be our intention is to do it yearly, mm -hmm. uh, this competition. But this is more for uh it has two tracks one to bring uh ideas to prototypes and another one prototypes to products uh okay. but still the price uh, it's not too much i think the the winner of the track two gets at the end uh, fifty thousand euros which is okay so for for uh for somebody that wants to start their idea but then we have the other tools uh for funding and to for growing which are uh, putting them in contact with uh, venture capitals so it's not uh directly uh, com coming from USPA from the hackathons or the prices, but the winners will be also eligible to uh, then uh, be put in contact with venture capitalists. And for that, we have a, a collaboration with the European Investment Bank, with the European Investment Funds, uh, in order to put this in place. And there are different activities that uh, that we are doing that. We have on the first, I think with tomorrow, we have the first, uh, I don't know how it's called, Investor's Day or uh, Innovator's Day. Uh, which uh, which some companies are already in contact with uh, with venture capital firms. I think we will come back to you to explore the the way we can support uh, the different SMEs, not only in uh, in uh, in the, the field of uh, renewable energy, but in the full uh, of course. area. Of course, the Cassini program is is completely transversal. So, uh, in order really to pu to push to to find the way of uh, pushing the the SMEs to to the track that uh, allow them to uh, to uh, to improve their user uptake and their sustainability. But I think it's it's something I, I, I'd like to discuss more in detail in order to be sure that I well understood uh, the, the different uh, way of supporting them. Of course. So, uh, thanks a lot for the, the discussion uh, and Thank for you. the presentation. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we will uh, keep in touch. So I think... Uh, the next speaker is uh, Maria uh, Berdal. So Maria, you are here. The floor is Hello. your your screen. We hear you clear and, and crystal. Okay, perfect. And I will uh, try to share my screen. Oh, I have to share the whole screen. Or you can choose a window if you wish. We see your screen, so it's okay. Just put it on uh, on slideshow, and uh, that will be okay. Okay. Do you see the the right version now? Uh, we see the the editor uh, mode. The edit. Okay. So you just have to <coughs> go to the slideshow, and uh, I think it will be good. Is it better? No. 
no <laughs> then i will duplicate and try to do without my notes but now you see the right the right one no no in your presentation your point mode So you can unshare and share again the screen. Yeah. Stop sharing. If you want to stop sharing and then you can share again. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You did it. It's better. Yeah, perfect. Okay, finally. <laughs> uh, so Yes, uh, my name is Maria Bardal. Uh, I work as a policy officer uh, in the Unit for Earth Observation in DG DEFIS, which stands for uh, Defense Industry and Space um, in the European Commission. Uh, but I'm seconded from uh, the Norwegian Space Agency, where I worked with um, the implementation of Copernicus uh, in Norway. Um, so, as Edward already told you about uh, the current portfolio and use of Copernicus for uh, renewable energy, um, the agreement was that I would uh, tell you a bit about the future outlook. And right now, uh, the services are mostly uh, focusing on uh, on continuity uh, and um, enhancing their current uh, products. So I will actually um, talk to you mostly about the space component uh, today. So we, we don't uh, the next slide uh, to move your slide. Uh, yeah. Great. Yes. <laughs> but uh, coming from the Commission, I will start with uh, a little recap of the European Green Deal. Uh, so the Green Deal will transform uh, the EU into a modern, resource efficient and competitive uh, economy with uh, the three main objectives of no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050, economic growth, decoupled from resource use and that no person and no place should be left behind. And as you can see from the building blocks, renewable energy plays a large part uh, in this. And... Uh, so, uh, the Repower EU uh, is a new initiative linked to the Green Deal and especially to the Fit for 55 package. Um, Edward also mentioned uh, this uh, briefly, uh, but I will mention some other aspects. Um, so, Repower EU uh, was launched, recently launched, uh, as a response to both the uh, general energy crisis uh, in Europe and uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, its aim is to provide uh, companies and households with affordable, secure and clean energy, uh, which requires decisive action. Uh, starting immediately with price mitigation and storing um, gas for next winter. Um, and um, it's also a massive scaling up and uh, speeding up of renewable energy in power generation, industry, buildings and uh, transport. Um, uh, it is now developed uh, a sort of guideline for uh, member states with best practices, with uh, Copernicus uh, well represented uh, in the use cases, such as uh, in uh, Denmark, where an online platform is covering the entire country um, and it uses area specific data on the environment, water, nature, and land use. And in Spain, the government has created a tool to help in strategic decision making on the location of large solar and wind uh, installations. Uh, and in Belgium, uh, an online wind farm sensitivity map for birds and bats aimed at identifying areas where um, wind turbines are located may pose uh, a risk to birds or bats. 
and informing and guiding more site level assessment and strategic planning. And um, so, just a quick, uh, you, all, uh, you all know uh, Copernicus. Um, it uh, consists of four uh, parts mainly. Um, the data acquisition, uh, the Copernicus services, uh, access and distribution uh, of data, and the user take. And now I will focus on the data acquisition uh, part. So these uh, are the first uh, batch of sentinels that we all know and, and love. Uh, and uh, I will not spend uh, much time uh, on this, but it, it felt uh, a bit strange to just uh, jump uh, to, to, the, to the new gang uh, without paying any respect uh, to, to the ones that are actually operating uh, right now. So we have Sentinel-1, 2, 3, 5P and 6 uh, in orbit, and then Sentinel-4 and 5 uh, are, are due for launch uh, in the next couple of years. And um, so on on to the to the new new batch or next uh, next um, batch of uh, sentinels, the expansion missions. Uh, most of them uh, will provide uh, products relevant for renewable energy, so I will go uh, through them uh, in a bit more detail. So the CO2 emission um, is probably the least uh, relevant in, in this uh, setting concerning uh, strictly uh, renewable energy, but uh, nonetheless a very important uh, mission. Um, with um, the um, the satellites and the related uh, CO2 monitoring and verification support uh, capacity uh, for to together uh, to detect anthropogenic uh, CO2 source sources, and then the verification support capacity will be um, provided by by the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. So um, this mission will provide uh, the with a unique and independent source of information to follow up on policies and um, help in decarbonizing Europe. Uh, here we see a demonstration of uh, the acquisition compared to other uh, CO2 monitoring satellites. The resolution will be um, for uh, times four kilo square kilometers and uh, the sampling uh, less than 2.2 kilometers for, for certain products. And we also see here uh, simulations uh, of CO2 uh, columns and NO2 plumes. Uh, other projects uh, include uh, methane and aerosol data and also cloud uh, detection. And then uh, we have and the Rose L uh, mission, Radar Observing System for Europe in L band, which responds to the requirements expressed for land monitoring, emergency management, and climate change and cryosphere services. Uh, its target applications are crop mass and, and type uh, discrimination, forest type, and cover. Uh, this is in support to biomass estimation, vegetation, soil moisture, food sec security, precision farming, and maritime surveillance, and um, also um, uh, some energy relevant uh, uh, products uh, are uh, higher resolution of wind retrievals and snow water equivalent. Uh, and we see some examples, uh, credit to, to ESA on the side here. Um, then we have the uh, uh, CRYSTAL, Copernicus Polar Ice and Snow Topographic Altimeter mission, which will provide enhanced retrieval of land, ice uh, and sheet, uh, land, sorry, land, ice, sheet and glacier um, elevation, sea ice thickness, 
uh, and freeboard and ocean surface elevation, wave length, wave height, and wind speed by measurements um, implementing higher spatial resolution. Um, Crystal directly um, answers to the EU Arctic policy, in which we had uh, an updated version uh, last year, last October. Uh, and uh, also to the user requirements expressed in uh, the previous Commission uh, Polar Expert Groups. Then uh, we have CHIME, the Hyperspectral Imaging Mission, which will provide routine hyperspectral measurements in support of EU policies for the management of natural resources uh, assets and benefits. Um, we have uh, the uh, the main uh, observations uh, for food security, agriculture and raw materials and soil properties. And uh, we also have uh, secondary applications for biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, forestry management, environmental degradation, lake and coastal ecosystem and water quality, snow grain, uh, snow grain size and albedo. And, and we also uh, have the products of snow wetness. Here we see um, the CHIME application domains and the thematic areas and the related uh, products. Then we have the Land Surface Temperature Monitoring Mission, the LSTM, um, which will complement uh, current visible and near-infrared uh, Copernicus observations uh, with high spatial temporal resolution. Uh, these observations will um, enhance, uh, oh, sorry, um, Yes, I'm sorry. They will cover uh, land and coastal regions in support of agriculture management services and um, a, a range of possible uh, additional services. Um, it will also um, uh, provide relevant products for uh, uh, to monitor energy waste in buildings. Then we have the similar mission, the Copernicus Imaging Microwave Radiometry mission, which will provide um, improved continuity of sea ice concentration monitoring missions, in particular in terms of spatial resolution, temporal resolution and accuracy, uh, and uh, especially near the ice edges. Uh, and uh, also all the water sea surface temperature uh, monitoring, which we see um, some examples of here from uh, Mercator. Uh, this um, simon is also um, responding um, well to the new EU Arctic uh, policy and, uh, and the before mentioned uh, user requirements from the polar expert groups. And then we have the Copernicus contributing missions, which was already mentioned um, earlier. Uh, and uh, I included them here uh, just to mention uh, that um, uh, these uh, data buys uh, provide uh, high res resolution uh, products, uh, which are fed mainly into the Copernicus uh, services and are also available uh, for for some public entities and other other uh, Copernicus users. Then uh, finally, uh, I will just say a few words uh, on the Copernicus services and cross cutting uh, activities. So as mentioned, uh, the focus is on continuity and uh, enhancement of, of existing products and portfolio for the Copernicus services. Um, 
Uh, yes, I, I found two examples uh, with the land surveys uh, now working on improving biomass uh, products. Uh, and, and the marine service uh, has a partnership with um, Ocean Energy uh, Europe uh, to promote the development of marine uh, renewable energy uh, technologies worldwide. Um, we are also starting up the Copernicus thematic uh, hubs, starting uh, with health and um, and coastal, uh, but. Uh, Energy is is one of, of the, the top uh, candidates for the next uh, batch. And then we also have the Knowledge, Knowledge Center of, for Earth Observation, um, which is um, mostly an internal EU um, coordinating tool and center to um, uh, do gap analysis, discover, uh, um, where where uh, Copernicus data and products uh, may be used in, in following up on EU policies uh, to fully explore the growing amount of, of EU, uh, EO data. And uh, that was it for me, for me. Thank you, Maria, for this presentation. Any question from Zoom or for the room? Uh, I have one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Maria. Just a question about uh, CO, CO2M, CO2 about the, the CO2 emission. Monitoring. Monitoring, yes. Um, I think that uh, I am sure that you have. Uh, some element of response about this because since we will have access to this uh, CO2 emission, there will be some um, uh, some overview of activities related to CO2 emission uh, worldwide. So it would be very strategic to, to have this type of information. Is it something that will be disseminated or used by uh, for policymakers only? Because uh, they will some they will have some disclosure about different countries that won't be very happy to to see their emission. Yes, the um, data and products uh, from the CO two M missions will be uh, open and free for everyone. Okay. Was this your question? Yeah. Yeah. It, yes. It, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is also. I also saw a question in the chat. Yes. Uh, related to CO two M. Um. So it's about. Oh, I can read it out loud. Uh, Isa has recently welcomed commercial uh, GHG sat high resolution methane measurements satellites as third party data. Will CO two M resolution for methane be comparable to GHG sat data? How much free GSAT data will be made available, at least for R and D? Okay, so for now, um, uh, GHG uh, SAT is a third-party mission uh, for ESA, and it's not a Copernicus contributing mission yet. Um, it it might be. Um, at a at a later uh, point, uh, but uh, yes. Um, uh, so so this is uh, on how much free GHG SAT data uh, will be available um, from ESA. Uh, I cannot uh, answer that. And if it becomes a Copernicus uh, contributing mission, this data will mostly be used um, for the Copernicus services. Uh, and also some uh, public uh, entities. Uh, so they are not uh, free and open uh, to everyone, but the products uh, derived from uh, GHG set would in that case uh, be, be available. Thank you very much, Maya, for the answer. And, oh, sorry. And the resolution <laughs> from GHG set, um, uh, it's uh, GHG said is mostly monitoring 
uh, hotspots. So the resolution is is somewhat different, and um, you could say that it's it's a higher resolution for from a GHG set, but uh, it it will not measure uh, everywhere, <laughs> sort of. Okay. And I see that someone else also wanted to answer this yeah. question. Uh, let's see. That. I think it's. Oh, no, no. no, that's okay. We have to um, the answer. That's perfect. Uh, the party there is pink. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria, for, for the answer and for your presentation. So, very. Thank you. I had uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, Come you on. You mentioned that the uh, CO2M uh, would be also doing cloud detection. Does that mean uh, just a cloud mask, or will it also provide more advanced cloud products like uh, cloud optical depth uh, or cloud type, that kind of thing? Um, so if the cloud detection is mostly for cloud masking, or if it's also a cloud product, this is the question. That's Sorry, it. I can hear very well. Um, yes. So. I'm not the one following this satellite the most uh, closely. I, to my understanding, it's uh, it's mostly for cloud masking. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I could um, I will check this uh, up. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, you, you can stop sharing, and then we will. Uh... We go to the last presenter, Jean. Yes. Welcome. The floor is yours. Bonjour. Let me try to share the right one. And, uh, let me know if you see it. Perfectly. OK, good. Um, Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So my name is uh, Jean Dissin. I'm working for DG Research and Innovation in the European uh, Commission, uh, where uh, basically uh, my activities are around the Eurogeo uh, initiative and the contribution of Europe uh, to the Group on Earth uh, Observation Initiative. Uh, in this case, I've been asked uh, by uh, Thierry to give a bit um, some ideas of uh, how uh, Eurogeo could be uh, an interesting uh, collaborative framework to help uh, upscaling uh, some uh, earth observation in the right applications, especially in the, in the field of uh, renewable energy applications. Um, let's see if I can go. Yes. First of all, just for the people around, I promise I will be short. I have only uh, two slides on. Uh, on uh, Rogeo, so what was uh, what it is about? It's about delivering an integrated European contribution to Geos, and as well, it has to go in both directions, increasing the Geos uh, and the Geo benefits uh, for uh, Europe. We try uh, to act a bit as an incubator to produce and test that observation service and applications in cooperation with, uh, of course, the Copernicus uh, program and. Uh, the the, your, the member states and uh, different participating uh, organizations that are members of this uh, geo like uh, the METSAT, the uh, ECMWF, uh, the European Space Agency, the European Environmental Agency, etc. Um, we try to foster the de delivery of specific Earth observation applications that can benefit from integrating uh, the global data sets made available to uh, geos. And of course, we try to promote as much as possible and scaling up and developing our observation application that are addressing uh, specific needs from the, their respective user community. It's not done in isolation. It's done, of course, closely with the existing uh, European uh, infrastructure. And I just mentioned uh, the DIAS, but I could have mentioned the uh, European uh, Open Science uh, Cloud, uh, the ESA, TEPS, uh, etc. And we, we are very 
uh, lucky that uh, we have at, uh, at our disposal, if I can say that, uh, a very uh, strong uh, financial instrument, which is the Horizon uh, Europe uh, program that allows us to, to target and to, to prepare our course and topics that helps fostering uh, those uh, efforts. So basically, if we have to, to summarize what it is, uh, uh, Roger, we often use those three Cs. It's about cooperating, coordinating our activities, and combines resource and, and knowledge. The second slide uh, is look a bit at, uh, OK, the previous slide was an ambition, uh, ambitious uh, program. How do we do it? How do we translate our, our ambitions into into act? Okay, as I mentioned, we uh, we use as much as possible the possibility to mobilize our uh, research and innovation funds from our uh, research program. We mobilize as well our stakeholders through the um, different voluntary based uh, actions group to develop a professional service. We try to build on the European Space Program, the Copernicus. Uh, we saw in the previous uh, presentation, Carlo and Maria gave a number of, uh, of examples of the existing uh, Copernicus uh, service can be leveraged uh, to, to develop uh, uh, Earth observation uh, solutions of interest to the, to, uh, on the renewable energies. Another way to, to have an impact is, of course, is uh, to get uh, visibility and uh, develop an ambitious uh, work program uh, in GEO and uh, look at what other regional uh, GEOs like uh, the African Oceania GEO, the Ameri GEO, or the Afri uh, GEOs are doing and which tools, how do they mobilize their respective uh, community. It was already mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, Maria was uh, did my job. I don't need any more to 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 discuss uh, the ambition, the ambitious uh, green deal uh, that have guided our actions in the last uh, two three years, with the objective of achieving achieving uh, climate climate neutrality by 2050, and this is entering in a climate law. And then uh, we had a number of uh, legal uh, package, and Eduardo mentioned the Fit for uh, 55 uh, package, which is a set of proposals to revise and update the EU legislation and to put in place new initiatives with the aim of ensuring that EU policies are in line with the climate goals agreed by the Council and the European Parliament. And in this um, package, it was already included uh, a proposal for a review of the renew renewable energy directive uh, with the objective to increase the, the current targets uh, from uh, 32 uh, to 40 uh, percent by 2030. And then came the war, came the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, three, three months ago. And uh, I have it a bit unfortunate if I can say that, uh, but this uh, trigger uh, an incredible acceleration of uh, of the of the actions around uh, uh, energy in the European Union for obvious uh, reason. Uh, of course, the, the, the first one being to to ensure and secure our energy independence. And uh, it was mentioned already by Philip uh, this this morning. The the Repower EU um, uh, outline of the action plan was uh, published just uh, two weeks after the start of the of the invasion. So it's a joint European action for more affordable, secure, and sustainable energy. And uh, OK, it includes, of course, higher or earlier targets for renewable energy. But if you look a bit more carefully into the document, there is already an invitation to member states to swiftly uh, map assess and ensure suitable lands and sea areas that are available for a renewable energy project. And I have to say that having been in the commissions for a, a number of years, I have not seen that many uh, legal documents that were inviting member states to, to do maps. So being a cartographer, I'm very happy with, uh, with that. Looking a bit more in details, uh, this uh, outline of this action plan was uh, converted into a, 
uh, more detailed plan just uh, two weeks ago with those three uh, pillars on saving more energy, producing more renewable energy in the EU, and diversifying the EU energy supply. So first of all, with an increase of the, uh, of the ambition from 40 to 45 percent by 2030, and a number of uh, legis legislation, including a new EU solar energy strategy that is supported by uh, some uh, guidance document and recommendations. And uh, on those recommendations, you see one on speeding up permit granting procedure for renewable energy projects and facilitating power purchase agreement. And that's even more specific because it goes into inviting member states to identify what they call the, what they call the go to areas, which have a lower environmental risk where investment can go ahead with short track permitting procedures not exceeding one year for wind or three months for solar, which is quite exceptional when you know where we are coming uh, from. And just already to say this, identify areas with lower environmental risk. You see that it fits quite well with the market uh, analysis that was done by the USPA, where uh, what, like 85% uh, of the of the of the market uh, potential on energy was on site selection, planning, uh, monitoring, assessment of uh, the potential environmental impact assessment. So, uh, so again, I, I'm sure that this will uh, this will uh, boost uh, the the, uh, the market in the, in the coming uh, months and year. Now, going uh, back to uh, Rogeo and how we can uh, help, uh, looking at uh, what we were saying, the, how we translate our ambitions. I was mentioning uh, that we try to mobilize uh, our research and innovation funds from Horizon Europe. And this is something that uh, we are doing in the topics we are preparing for the next uh, World Program 23-24. Uh, that includes as well, and that will be on my next slides, uh, the, the calls that are published on the, on the different Horizon Europe uh, missions. Due to uh, the COVID situation, I have to say that those voluntary-based uh, action groups of the Rogeo were not very uh, active in the last uh, two years. And so, and we have an action group on applications for energy. I think that that would be an excellent opportunity to relaunch and to, to bring together the community to see how we can join force in developing more uh, uh, better uh, applications. Uh, another uh, channel that we were proposing to, uh, to foster uh, the, this market was to take advantage of the space program and in particular Copernicus. Uh, Carlo presented uh, earlier uh, this afternoon the C3S uh, service. And in the guidance document of the Repower AU, there is a reference to the in Energy and Industry Geography Lab that our, uh, our colleagues from the Joint Research Center have, uh, have uh, developed. I was mentioning the ambitious uh, work program in GEO, and I'm pleased to, to have seen that uh, the, the new version has been recently uploaded of the GEO uh, initiative. I didn't put, because I think that for the moment is maybe not the most urgent uh, channel to explore on how to liaise with other regional GEO. I mentioned the mission uh, adaptation to uh, climate uh, change that is aims at supporting around 150 regions and communities in Europe towards reaching climate resilience by fostering the development of innovative solutions. It's a bit different from what uh, usually we were used to see in Horizon 2020. It's quite unique in, in, in the sense that it uh, starts with uh, leveraging and uh, making the best use of the results of uh, of previous uh, research uh, project and to see how they can be turned into demonstrators, into uh, innovative uh, solutions. You see that uh, there were some uh, mission uh, info days and you see the link that you can still uh, uh, consult to have more information on the topics that were open uh, a few, um, I think it was the 11th of May, so just less than a month uh, ago. 
you can still register uh, at least uh, to attend digitally the first mission forum that will take place on the 7th of uh, June. And okay, we hope to be able to uh, uh, to go quickly in uh, granting uh, the, the, the topics that are open uh, for um, for making proposal with the deadline of the 27th of September. And I spot uh, two uh, two topics that could be uh, interesting for you uh, to consider with their uh, respective uh, budget. One is a uh, research and innovation action. The other is an innovation uh, action. What's coming next? Uh, it's still a bit too early to release uh, very detailed uh, information uh, on the next uh, War Program 23-24 because it has to go and uh, being uh, um, uh, it has to be first of all validated by the member, the program committee of uh, of the member states and the associate countries to Horizon Europe. Then it has to go into what we call the inter-service consultation. That means that. Uh, the topics we are proposing have to be somehow improved, endorsed, or commented by all the, the different uh, DGs, and we hope that it will be published uh, towards the end, the end uh, of the year, uh, of the year, so that the first calls can be issued just in December, January, so coinciding with the, the start of the year 2023. So you see that it will be still on customization and pre-operationalization pre of prototypes and user service, still support to the Eurogeo initiative, still filling observation gaps because uh, uh, all the, um, it was underlined in several of the presentation today, uh, observation gaps and in-situ data are absolutely uh, needed if you want to to make uh, a usable, uh, usable uh, service. We are still interested to have uh, calls and topics to support uh, the input of citizen uh, science to monitor reports, but not only monitor reports and their environment, but to be able to, to act uh, to protect their environment. So we try to go a bit one step further uh, in engaging uh, citizens becoming really actors of the uh, environment. They are not just counting birds, but example that they are trying to to influence environmental policy just an example of this energy and industry geography uh, lab that is mentioned in the repower uh, eu um, uh, package uh, so uh, it was launched in, uh, in december it's intended as an enabling and empowering instrument to support planning choice by national and regional authorities we may not otherwise have immediate access to these data sets and if you look at it, you, you see that clearly there is uh, space, uh, room for improvement, and uh, some of the solutions that were uh, presented uh, this morning, uh, uh, I would encourage them to liaise with our colleagues from the, the GRC to, 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 to give uh, visibility uh, to their work and to see how their work could be included in that uh, platform. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. Um, any question from uh, the room? Or for the, uh, for the Zoom? So I was uh, impressed to see that uh, I, I discovered this uh, geographical, uh, this uh, energy and industrial geography uh, labs that I will take. Uh, uh, again, a look on that. Thank you for, for showing that. Uh, Edouard, sorry that we uh, you, you have to leave, but then we will start the discussion uh, directly if you wish, because we are a bit late, and we will uh, for the uh, or for the online coffee we will have a, a, a bit of delay. Sorry. So um, I would like uh, to thank all the participants of, of this uh, of this uh, journey uh, today of this uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, I'd like to open the discussion uh, on, uh, on different topics that we have and that are of interest in my point of view, according to uh, what you have shown here uh, and what we have uh, seen during all the, the, the day about the repowering, uh, repower EU, uh, about uh, all the activity that are pushing the renewable energy. 
And uh, the, my, my main question is uh, from the point of view of the room and from the point of view of the, the participant is really uh, your view on the, the, the different presentation we have today uh, on the, 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 the different applications that, that are developed and the way you, you see them and if they are in your point of view, a potential impact in the policy and on the, uh, on the uh, potential development of renewable energy uh, in, in Europe. So if there are any comment from uh, anyone around the table, uh, feel free to, uh, to go on. Uh, I, I think we had uh, this nice example about uh, uh, the solar urban, uh, solar the, solar, uh, the solar rooftop with some example uh, from Philippe uh, and also some slide that showing some rooftop initiative. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, the, the ambition from Europe is to push uh, the development of solar energy. How do you think we can organize the things or how the, the thing that are extracted from ESHEP and from the other activity can support really uh, the policy uh, makers in this direction? And if there is some action uh, to, to organize in order to, uh, to push this, uh, this direct link from prototype to, uh, to activities for, the, for the, the, the decision maker and for even for the industry. So any one who want to take the floor? Yes, Philippe. Yes, in, in, thank you, Thierry. Yes, indeed, we, when we read the, the rooftop initiative, uh, for us, it was a, a very strong signal for, for rooftop uh, PV. And for us, that we are providing services about the development of PV on rooftop, but not the, only on, on rooftop, but on shades and, and places like this, not on the natural uh, uh, places, but uh, on, the, on urban area. Uh, we have the feeling that it's now or never to develop and to take, to take off uh, uh, applications such as the one we are proposing uh, within shape. So, so for us, it's very important because we, at least in France, before this signal, we have we had the feeling that it's difficult to develop. We have the PPE, which which is the pluriannual plan for energy in France, who state that we will have some a huge amount of uh, PV, including on rooftop. But for the moment, um, it's kind it's kind of uh, break by different elements that has has been missed in the in the in the report of the solar rooftop in, initiative. So if that's this initiative free all these limits, then we think that indeed it's the time or never to, to start such a such application. This is our opinion. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Maria, uh, Jean or, or Eric, do you think that uh, um, what you seen today will be uh, of interest for, for the different uh, DG that can then uh, taking bo on board the reflection, the different support came in from uh, from the, the the research and the the, the innovation developed in, uh, in this activity. And if I can give a try, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Maria present briefly in her presentation the coming uh, knowledge center uh, on Earth observation that. Uh, the uh, DG DEFIS is developing with uh, the Joint Research Center. We would like to take the opportunity to, to say that uh, from the, the research and innovation perspective, uh, we have uh, agreed as, as well with the Joint Research Center to support this initiative and to see how we can add a sort of uh, uh, science pillar to the knowledge uh, center where uh, we could expose uh, uh, the results of the um, uh, of the research uh, projects and that could be a way to see to, to look for a, a better matching between what are the user the policy makers uh, expectations from the, the different dgs that have uh, new uh, legislative package like this uh power au or uh, or the reform of the common agriculture, uh, agriculture policy, where the, the court of auditors is uh, inviting the commissions to make uh, 
a better use of the of the huge uh, potential of the Copernicus uh, programs. And there are many uh, examples in uh, DG Mare, in uh, DG International Partnership uh, INPA. And so I think that would be a, a good, uh, relatively e e easy way to 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 better. Uh, uh, secure the feedback to uh, to policy of the and the leveraging uh, the outputs of the uh, of the the project that we have uh, funded uh, in the course of the last uh, uh, ten years and even more. Thank you, Jean Maria. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So unfortunately, uh, I was not able to follow. Um, uh, this uh, workshop uh, from the beginning and of course everything uh, mentioned in in this uh, session uh, has been relevant since uh, it's all been very connected to to Copernicus and I uh, I liked your uh, idea Jean um, I noted it down research pillar in uh, KCO that's um, yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, a good idea. I think. Yeah. I mean, um, research is always of essence uh, in in making policies. So it, it could be it could be the right link uh, through the KCO. Absolutely. So by by chance we record anything? So Maria, if you want to take a look uh, more in detail or to the presentation of uh, this morning, that would be easier. To yeah. be available soon, mm -hmm. and you will be able to see that uh, some of the uh, um, presentation are, are really close to the market and uh, close to uh, real uh, operational application, and so that's that's really the idea. And we are discussing with some of our partners uh, today uh, in in this time about the potential in terms of market development of some of the, of the activity and the uh, repo EU and the uh, solar rooftop, uh, the European solar rooftop initiative, uh, just fall down like uh, something that we are just waiting for. And so that's uh, really a, a big opportunity. And I think maybe we have to, we may need some recommendation to promote all the uh, activity done in not only in shape but uh, at a larger scale uh, using Earth's observation to, uh, to the different DG and showcase what we are, we are doing in order to support uh, the decision makers on that and so if you have some ideas the, about that that would be great uh, to to follow uh, the link yes eric uh, you should... yes working now yes okay just uh, maybe uh, to to react on your on your last comment i think <clears throat> if i think about destiny that would put a lot of focus on uh, modeling that would, let's say, come with a lot of new data and a lot of complementary data with use cases and a partnership embedded. I think this would be a very nice uh, type of um, a way to demonstrate the potential for uh, at European scale or global scale of some of the services I've seen this morning. Because if the methodology is applicable at larger scale, and if we can demonstrate that there is a, a commercial part that can be, uh, let's say, left aside, but there is a public part that can be prepared and even onboarded as part of the destiny, for example, modeling, that would be, I think, the type of win-win and that the the Commission is looking for and that we are trying to push and to support for policymaker and uh, decision taking. Thank you for, for the suggestion. It, uh, it's some, something we have in mind, of course, and I think uh, linking also the climatologic aspect uh, with um, with all the, the energy application is also key. And uh, um, Carlo uh, show us some of the uh, potential uh, in this uh, discussion. And uh, it was uh, also in our mind that uh, the, the insurance, the bankers are looking for such a kind of application, uh, really to, to have a better view on the, on the, on the best potential uh, projection that we can have in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, climate, uh, of climatology and energy projection for the long term. 
So that that's really uh, our feeling uh, on the on 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 Niche, but not only on the different action we have around the energy, are really pushing the idea that uh, uh, there is a conjunction of of things that are here, and that uh, we can take the opportunity from the European uh, point of view to push them uh, as fast as we can in order to have a, a really a breakthrough uh, in uh, in the use of Earth observation. Yes, Eric. Just maybe one comment there. Maybe there is as well the other direction to be considered from you. What would be the the type of action that should be uh, done like in this program, Copernicus, Destiny, to make sure that this is happening? Uh, what would be, and translate this into very pragmatic, concrete action, what would be the the uh, the function the service that uh, we should put in operation to make sure that you are successful in transforming this into a real operational uh, and commercial services yeah uh, i think there are in our point of view many things to do and one of these is really um, uh, to promote uh, the, the the way of helping uh, the smes in terms of innovation because they are going fast and they are able to to develop some very interesting thing. So find, trying to find some tracks for that, that's the first point. Uh, the idea there in terms of uh, research is also important. I, I show this morning this uh, this conveyor belt uh, that uh, that is for me uh, uh, something that I, I, I really trust on uh, because it's really showcasing um, how from an idea you go to, to, to the market and to something which is uh, really a, a commercial value and can support the activity and really we should put some effort in order to, uh, to be sure that all the case on all the, uh, all the step, all the step all the, all for the different tracks are really uh, sustained in order to promote the activity. And so the flexibility is something very important for this process. And also what we notice, and uh, Meret, uh, uh, which is still here, uh, underlined uh, this morning, is, uh, is the training aspect. Uh, I, I, it was key on, on what she said, and that's really interesting. Uh, we, we tried to do so uh, in the solar domain uh, for some years, but I think it's still needed uh, to be done and to link really with the user, the citizen, but also the industrial to really train them to understand uh, the world of Earth observation and uh, to understand their need also. So this interconnection is really important. Uh, and so I think there is also this, uh, this connection which is key and that can support really the development of activity in, in our point of view. And I think it's something which is shared uh, in, uh, in the room. Uh, they have all the same uh, question with the user and they, there is always this step of training which is needed. But I think maybe we should uh, think about uh, uh, trying to um, to improve this uh, this part and the Copernicus Academy uh, approach and uh, all the uh, uh, coordination that can be done in terms of training at the European level can be really of support in my point of view. Um, any comment or question for the room or point you want to raise? The last step maybe would be okay. We the the European Commission and the plan for renewable energy is okay. We are ready for the for the data. Uh, there are there are some uh, uh, companies that are ready to install. Now we have to convince the investors. The, the investor, banks. the banks, yes. And maybe um, maybe we don't have enough. Uh, application towards them to yeah for the insurance and for the bankers that that's a point um, from the solar uh, domain what i uh, i uh, realized some uh, one or two years ago uh, when we were looking uh, about uh, the way to include the bankers on on our activity and to discuss with them a point that I discover and that I uh, realize more than discover is the fact that today there is no uh, solar project which is done uh, without Earth observation data uh, previously used for defining the, the project. The big one. The big one, yes. Major, major, the big one, not the rooftop. 
not the rooftop and so that that uh, that's maybe something that will come but for the big system uh, there is always a observation be and behind that and that's really something we we should stress and even for the wind it's uh, the same that's something we should stress and maybe to um, if we want to promote a observation in uh, in, in the exception it um, using uh, in situ uh, satellite and uh, and also the models uh, we, we should stress to anyone that Earth observation is anywhere and used and promote the use of uh, of this and uh, to uh, always underline this. That can be something which is relevant to, to push also uh, that and make uh, the industry, uh, the users, the decision maker understand the the, the potential of, uh, of uh, Earth observation in the domain. So uh, that was nice that you uh, turned the question, uh, Eric, in that way. Uh, but um, I, I think um, we, we need also from uh, from your point of view uh, the sub recommendation to convince uh, the good persons and the one that can understand and push uh, on the use of us of observation uh, for for renewable energy and of course we are more than uh, welcoming or any suggestion on this domain uh, if you have any. Yes, Eric. Uh, we just repeat because maybe I was not clear, but my experience and is limited, meaning I, I don't know the, uh, the area of uh, energy, but my experience is that the best way to convince is when you have something to show. Therefore, if you can, and, and here we are, we can help, and the Commission is really uh, putting a lot of energy to, to help on that. If we can demonstrate the scalability of any of the services I've seen or that have been discussed, I'm sure we can build, uh, you can build, uh, the, the companies can build uh, very solid uh, um, cases to, uh, to go and to demonstrate that this is not just and just sorry for the church this is not research this is operational and i think this is the the step that is missing and to be to demonstrate that there is the operational capabilities and here i think for me it's just the the demonstration to put it in operation even at a small scale but demonstrate that you can uh, you can go wide after okay point taken thank you very much uh any comments Point you want to raise in the room or uh, on the Zoom? So, if there is uh, no more discussion around the, the topic, I think uh, I would like to thank all the participants, all the attendees uh, on this uh, on this session. That we that was really a very interesting. Uh, uh, discussion. Uh, we have recorded uh, anything and hopefully we will uh, make them available soon on, on the website. Yes, for the, Sorry? Can you, tu peux faire un, un rappel de nous envoyer les PDF ou pas? Yes. Okay. If you, if you can uh, send us uh, your PDF version of, uh, of uh, your presentation, uh, we will make them also available on the website of eShape and we will promote them. Uh, and we hopefully come back to, to you to discuss uh, on different topics uh, because I, I saw many interests in the room and the, in the in the discussion we have around. Thank you very much. That was a great day and uh, thanks a lot for your participation. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you.